Yes, we're, we're, we're live, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you, that's great. Uh, so, uh, welcome to this meeting of the Health Care and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee being held on Friday, 21st September 2022. I'm Councillor Alyssa Swinghurst and I chair this committee. Uh, fire and emergency evacuation for those present in the meeting. Fire alarm sounds, please leave the building by the nearest exit and make your way to the fire assembly point in the car park. The agenda paper and other relevant information for this meeting are available for public viewing on the Heritage Council website. Council is streaming this meeting live on the Heritage Council YouTube channel and making a recording. To ensure that recording quality is maintained, please speak as clearly as possible and keep background noise to a minimum. Please ensure that mobile phones and other devices are turned to silent. Others are permitted to film, photograph and record public meetings provided it does not disrupt the business of the meeting. We have no members of the public present. Only committee members who are present in the room may vote. Uh, we have a number of people in attendance as virtual participants. And can I request that they use the raise hand function within the system if they wish to contribute and to introduce themselves when they're called upon? So, uh, agenda item number one, apologies for absence. Apologies for absence have been received from committee member Councillor Carol Gandhi. Apologies have also been received from Councillor Crockett, who's the cabinet member for health and adult well-being. Name substitutes. We have no name substitutes. Number three, declarations of interest. Do any members wish to declare any Schedule 1, Schedule 2 or other interests in any agenda item? No, thank you. Minutes, the minutes of the meeting held on the 22nd of July 2022 are included in the agenda, pages 9 to 16 for approval. No matters of accuracy have been notified to the monitoring officer. Are you content that I sign the minutes as an accurate record? Please uh, show with hands, thank you. Thank you. And, and may I add that they were very excellent minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item number five, questions from members of the public. No questions have been received from members of the public on this occasion. Agenda number six, questions from members of the council. No questions have been received from councillors. Right, agenda item number seven, uh, report on obesity in Herefordshire. Um, and I'm just going to... I'm just going to start by saying that um, uh, to make a comment on behalf of the committee, because I think we all feel the same. Way, it's been a, it's a really excellent report. Um, so on behalf of the committee, I'd like to thank the Director of Public Health, Matt Pierce, for such a high standard work. That's really appreciated. Um, we can clearly see that. I, mean, I can clearly see that there was a through line from uh, the, the our request for information, what we wanted to look at, and what you presented in the report. With a, with a very good level of detail, clearly expressed and really uh, exemplary, high standard of work. And I would also like to thank the other supporting officers for this meeting who've done a fantastic job as well. So thank you all. So that being said, um, we have a number of participants in attendance um, to contribute to this item. And I will ask them to introduce themselves and their involvement in this topic just briefly so that committee members know who you are and, and what, your, what your expertise is. Um, so I'll start with Matt Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for your kind words on the report. So um, lots of people contributed to that, so thanks for everyone um, for that. So my name is Matt Pearce, I'm the Director of Public Health, um, and I also have a specialist interest in, in obesity. Uh, this is my come across in the paper. <laughs> thank you. And uh, Professor Paul Gately is with us virtually. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. Um, I'm a professor of exercise and obesity at Leeds Beckett University. I also led on Public Health England's uh, programme of work around whole systems approaches to obesity, which we work with up to 80 local authorities to help determine how best to sort of look at the strengths that local authorities had to uh, collate all of their actions around uh, and around obesity, um, given the state they're, they're in, whichever state, uh, considering the needs of local communities and therefore pulling together programmes that enable action on obesity. 
Thank, thank you, Professor Gatley. Thank you very much for attending the meeting. Uh, Lindsay McCarty. Lindsay. Good afternoon. Yes, Lindsay McCarty. I'm public health specialist uh, and I am responsible for uh, public health commissioning and also the public health lead uh, with the child working with the children and families directorate. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Welcome. I'm Tina Dixon. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, my name is Tina Dixon. I'm a primary care commissioning manager within the integrated care board. I work very close with primary care and primary care networks, um, and I also lead on weight management and health service um, ac across primary care. Thank you, Russian. Thank you for attending. Um, Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Emma Fisher. I'm the ICB lead for prevention and personalised care and work closely with Tina and Anna and wider system partners. Thank you. And Anna Swift. Hi, I'm um, Anna Swift and I'm the lead for children, young people and obesity at NHS Herefordshire and Worcestershire, working to support the system around um, weight management, work really closely with the public health team as well as NHS services. Thank you. Uh, Philippa Ellis. Hello, I'm Philippa Ellis. I'm the top community health and wellbeing service manager. I manage the healthy lifestyle services across the county in Herefordshire. Thank you. And I'm glad finally, Christine Price. Hi, Christine Price, <laughs> Chief Officer of Health Watch Herefordshire. And our role is to um, gather the views of the residents of Herefordshire. Thanks very much. And before I ask Matt Pierce to, to, to make a brief presentation, um, does the leader have anything you'd like to say at this point? I think this is a really important <clears throat> topic. Um, so much pressure on health services at the moment, but uh, some of it is caused by uh, overweighting people. And uh, we look forward to this discussion about that and how it can help. Um, this is a beautiful, beautiful county we live in. Great place to go, to go out and exercise and walk. Uh, we uh, we need to take full advantage of, of where we live. So I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Lita. So, uh, Mr. Fitz. Yeah, sorry, Chair. We just got another colleague, Kristen Pritchard, just for that. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, sorry, Kristen. Thank you. Um, I'm Kristen <laughs> Pritchard. I'm a health improvement practitioner in the public health team. Thank you. So, Mr. Fitz, please carry on with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so um, it, these are only a very few slides. I thought it might be helpful just to provide a bit of context and summarise what was in the report, just to maybe um, help, help with the conversation. Um, so I think really, I think the first slide is just talking about some of the challenges facing Herefordshire uh, with regards to um, people who are overweight and very overweight, uh, also known, known as obesity. Um, and interestingly, in Herefordshire, we don't Actually, stand very well in terms of our, our, our obesity prevalence and, and the number of people who are overweight and obese. So we actually, uh, across children and adults, we are higher than the national average. So it's clearly something that, 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 that's important um, for Herefordshire, and that has significant consequences um, to um, the health system, the economic system, and society as, as a whole. And when you look at the numbers, it is quite startling. 67% of adults are overweight or obese, which equates to about over 105,000 adults. So we're talking almost uh, as if, if it's normal to be overweight and obese. So it's a real concern um, as, a, as a significant public health issue. In terms of physical activity as well, we, we actually fare better in terms of the number of individuals being physically active, but still 20% um, of adults don't do uh, more than 30 minutes physical activity per week. So again, it's, an, it's another issue that we, we need to address uh, here in Herefordshire. And we also know with obesity, as with other conditions, it, it disproportionately affects a number of people, particularly people with learning disability, people on a lower social, uh, lower income, people with mental health conditions and ethnically diverse groups. You won't be able to see this slide, but I think it is really important. And this was in the, um, in the report, and this was done some time ago now. And it's a foresight report. And what it's really helpful to do, it, it, it's helpful to show the complexity of obesity. It's not just about eating and physical activity. There's over 100 different determinants that can actually lead and influence our, our body weight. 
So it's a very, very complex issue, and I'm sure Paul uh, Gately will be able to comment more into it as a play, the whole system approach can help tackle this. But this diagram also helps illustrate the different key areas, such as food production, biology, food consumption, society influences, individual psychology, and the activity environment around us. All these different things shape how we live our lives, uh, and therefore how it, sometimes it can be difficult to influence all these different determinants. But it also illustrates that actually not one single organisation can influence how um, we, we lead our lives. It's a, it's a, it's a multifactorial problem, multiple partners from a national level, from a regional level to a local level. All these different partners need to come together to, to tackle this really important issue. This is a very high level slide. I've tried to conceptualize in the slide kind of the key um, actions that are being undertaken across heritage. And there is some really good work being undertaken. I think we need to acknowledge that. Um, at a national level, the child obesity plan, I know there's conversations going nationally in terms of how that's going to be taken forward over, over the next few years. That's a really groundbreaking plan, recognizing that actually we do need some national policy levers, um, such as a sugar tax, as, as, as well as lots of other things. But we know the evidence is strong and it can have a big influence on our, on our health, on our weight. Um, there are some gaps in our weight management support in Herbridge across children and adults, um, and, and those are illustrated within the report, and that's something that the committee might wish to consider going forward. Um, over the last couple of years, there's been a real welcome focus from NHS England. They've started to invest in some um, support programmes. The National Diabetes Prevention Programme is one of them and also an NHS digital weight management programme too. So that's really welcome, but, but we know there's more that can be done. Here in Herefordshire, um, Kristen in particular, to my left, there's some really fantastic work on the Food Alliance and Sustainable Food Places and Programmes. We know that food and dietary behaviour is really, really important, and it's the environment around us that influences those choices we make. So there's some really great work being undertaken um, locally here on that. We also know there's a county-wide prescriptivity strategy that's recently been endorsed by the Health Wellbeing Board, and that's a really important part to play, and that work's being undertaken. Talk Community, another really well-known programme in Herefordshire, we do some fantastic work to that bottom-up approach, working with our community, signposting people to local support and interventions, and our local health training service. And we also know that there's a co-benefit to tackling climate change, and there's some fantastic work again going with the county around that. And there's win-wins for obesity uh, with, regard, with that regard. I think more recently the um, formation of the integrated care system and how we work with our NHS colleagues provides a real good opportunity about how we actually work collectively together to tackle obesity. Again, that's a relatively new phenomenon, but it presents a really good opportunity and there's some great work going on within primary care networks, our local surgeries, to actually pilot and understand what more we can do. And then there's some other local programmes around holiday activity fund and get active programme. Again, many of these, these are uh, in the report. Again, this is a very uh, a small infographic you might not be able to see, but this is just a really helpful diagram that kind of illustrates across the life course what weight management interventions we have in place. Um, the triangle really represents that at the bottom we've got universal provisions that supports people to maintain a healthy weight. Um, at the next tier up, we've got those that are overweight, what support we have in place. And at the top, at the more severity of the obesity, we have more specialised services. So it's quite a helpful pictorial kind of diagram to, to reflect that. And then at the bottom, you just have your cross-cutting themes in terms of the built environment. We know how important that is, the density of fast food outlets, how we can encourage people to be more physically active, active travel, those kind of initiatives. So just a summary of the recommendations, I won't go through all of these as they're in the report, but there are a few recommendations that committee might want, want to consider, such as looking at and um, addressing some of the gaps or recommendations in our weight management pathways. It's around um, raising the awareness of, of healthy weight services to our local communities. It's about working with health professionals so that they can actually feel confident in raising the issue of body weight with patients as well, so they can support and signpost them and build them on the fantastic work around our sustainable food programme. So, I won't go through those in more detail, but I hope that's helpful, Chair, just to, to set some context. Thank you very much, Mr. It's very helpful. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to start, um, you know, clearly this is, this is absolutely crucial, and the government recognises that. Um, what, what I would be interested in um, hearing from Professor Gately uh, is some more detail around the whole system approach and uh, 
how would he describe that? What is the benefit of a whole system approach? And what would be the best way of developing uh, Heritage Council's work uh, using that model? Professor Gailey. Thank you. Um, it it's always really it's always really helpful when you've when you've had a really good outline and i and i totally agree that uh that matt's sort of overview is really helpful giving us a really good background i guess what what matt outlined was um in that systems map from about it was about 15 years ago that was drawn up for the foresight report and and it shows the complexity of the interactions between all the different key variables and then some clustering around them um, in terms of physical activity influences, dietary influence, biological influence, social influences. So, so we understand the system is complex. Um, and, and forgive me, I didn't, I didn't uh, get the name of the council that I mentioned, the beautiful county of Herefordshire. And, and that's one of the critical features, is that the strengths and challenges of a local area need to be considered when we take action. And, and that earlier diagram as a national foresight map was a national picture. So, you know, I, I can talk, I live in Yorkshire now, I can talk about Yorkshire as a beautiful county and I, and I know Herefordshire is a beautiful county, but I came, but I came from Manchester. And not many people talk about Manchester being a beautiful place. And so the point is, is that Manchester is a very urban area and its needs and strengths and challenges are very, very different. Now, I, now I know you all appreciate that. The question is, is how do we take that understanding at a national level and put it into practice at a local level? And I, I think there's, there's two points to make here. The first point is Matt's already outlined that you have some good, but could be improved local services that help people. Now, from a return on investment perspective, and the evidence is very clear on this, the return on investment for the county and indeed for the health system, as well as individuals themselves, that a good provision of services is absolutely critical. So that obviously requires the continued investment or improvement investment. And the, the evidence is very clear that if that investment is, is, is there and is delivered effectively through good service provision, then that return on investment will be, will be achieved. I think the second element to this is when we take our whole systems approaches, the work we did with Public Health England and a large number of local authorities was to, was to take that foresight map from 15 years ago and say, how do we make that relevant to a local authority? Um, and how do we make that relevant, not just to a local authority, but to a local authority that is changing, you know, and we, we, five or six years ago, we would not have imagined Brexit, Ukraine, COVID, but it's, they, those things have hit us and we'd had to respond. And, and I'm sure like you, like, you know, I'm sure your county's responded in a fantastic way to those sort of challenges and, and you continue to. The point about those challenges is we have to be prepared for emergence and the emergence of new issues. And, and often what's happened in the past is strategies with sort of, you know, just treatment programs or intervention programs I'm done in isolation. And, and then they run on for several years without really sort of reflecting and changing and adapting and modifying. And so what a whole systems approach tries to do is, is firstly say, what are the local strengths? Um, you know, what are the local strengths? We've heard about the beautiful nature of Herefordshire, but what are the key businesses? You know, can they be utilised more effectively what are the key, other key strengths from across Herefordshire? How can they be aligned? What are the key strategic goals of leaders across Herefordshire? And how do you weave a BST in rather than push a BST out? So consideration of that. What are the directions of the health system and the educational system and the, and the transport system? These are all really critical questions. And what a whole systems approach tries to do is to very quickly in, in a series of workshops, pull that information together and then align it to the, to the local data and begin to work on a plan. And that plan is, is relevant to the needs, the strengths and the goals of, of those stakeholders. And, and often a lot of this is, is done, but really um, the consensus is, is 
is often done in isolation on one to all parts of the system. So, so you know, how involved are people with a lived experience in, in this? Uh, and that's an absolute critical part. How involved are other stakeholders? And whilst, whilst there are views of commercial elements of the system, it's, you know, if we, if we look at those as assets in our area, then actually how do we knock on the door of some of the, the big companies or the strong companies within Hereford should say, well, you know, if you're a big company, you're likely to be a big employer and this could have an impact on you. And how could you help? You know, that's the sort of means by which a whole system begins to come together. Um, and, you know, Public Health England, or as is now OHID, um, worked with us to develop a guide. And, and really all, all the local authority needs to do is carry out that guide. The one thing I would say is, the colleagues within the local authority need some support and resource to be able to do it well. It's a lot of work pulling together those stakeholders, working on that and driving it. There are organisations like Lee Beckett that are supporting local authorities to put those in place, but equally there's others that can do it too. And, they, and, if, and if local leaders, if local practitioners followed the guide, then it can be delivered. So it's, it's simply a toolkit that more and more local authorities are now using to, to utilize the strengths and overcome the weaknesses, but most importantly, in the context of that local authority uh, to achieve its goals. I'm very happy to answer any questions you might have, but I hope that gives an overview of what a systems approach tries to do. Thank you, thanks Professor Blakely. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for me, it's, it's trying to figure out what is the local response to this and what is it that's gonna, uh, or work for us. Obviously, there, there, there is activity going on. There's work going on. It, it, it feels a little bit uh, not quite coordinated, and, um, and looking for opportunities to develop and work alongside our NHS colleagues, the ICS colleagues, um, to, to to arrive at something that's a kind of seamless um, service provision. Put it like that, but on on all tiers, on all levels, and that, that just I don't kind of get that feeling, and so. What 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 was in my mind kind of initially was that we don't um, we don't have a healthy weight strategy as such, and we've got an emerging health and well being strategy, which seems to me is likely to be very high level, and therefore will lack detail, will lack granularity, will be um, you know uh, an, an iteration of ambition. Um, but would it be worthwhile to actually have a healthy weight uh, strategy? using the whole systems approach probably and working alongside colleagues from uh, ICS uh, to, to, to develop something that, that has that local feeling but more granularity, more detail. And would that be um, you know, where, where we need to, to, to put some effort in so that it's actually kind of going somewhere that's a single place and not at the moment, it seems a little bit fractured um, so I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Pierce, what, what do you think would, would that be? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it, I think that the, as Professor Gately just outlined, I think it's almost, there's lots of, like you say, there's good work going on, isn't there? So lots of good work mm. going around climate change. We have a physical activity strategy. We have food sustainability work going on. Um, we have lots of work going on in active travel. So we don't want to kind of duplicate all that work, but I think it's kind of bringing it together. Yeah. And I think when um, I was actually involved in the national pilot of the whole systems approaches, which Professor Gailey, uh, Gailey worked on, um, and, and just to give you a sense of what that involves, it, you bring partners together over a series of kind of three to four workshops, and Professor Gailey might, might want to do more on that. And it is just literally getting together and understanding what we're all doing, but then also thinking actually, where, is it, where do we best focus our efforts as well? Where can we get the maximum value in terms of working together? Because you could spread, this, spread yourself so thinly. Um, so I think there is merit in, in bringing people together. Um, if, if a strategy was to be developed, I think it's almost just acknowledging that some things are already happening. It's just bringing that together in a coherent yeah. kind of fashion, if that makes sense. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's, just not, it's not saying that there's nothing happening, but, but rather that I think we, we could get more benefit from what's happening if, if it was, um, you know, joined up with the strategy and also the strategy would then be able to seek out other areas of synergy within the complex nature of work for the council which is always the thing for me whenever you're looking at almost anything that 
the council has so many complex areas of activity, but there are lots of opportunities across it and it's embedding the thought across all functions of the council. But in order for that to happen, we need to have, have, have seen the identified the opportunities. Um, so, so one of them being obviously in, in planning, which, which you mentioned in the report, that we should have a health impact assessment toolkit for, for planners, which I agree with. I think that, that absolutely makes sense. In, in, in a reasonably broad interpretation of health or health and well-being, that you know, we should be taking that into account. Um, so rather than sort of thinking of planning is planning and planning is health, and one thing does affect the other. Um, but a strategy would help to coalesce these thoughts, I think, is what where, where I'm at. So my uh, the, the recommendation that, that, that was in my mind was that we should um, look at um, requesting the, the executive to consider uh, a healthy weight strategy with these broad provisos of the, the whole system approach, et cetera, as discussed. Um, but, so that was that, that was uh, that was my session. I think Councillor Summers wants to come in. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. I could probably write a couple of chapters on how the mind affects obesity, but I won't do that right now because I couldn't talk for that long. But simply put, there needs to be a, be a whole system strategy on obesity. Um, and it's, at all age, it's an all age strategy. Now, I'd like to ask both, um, well, ask the room if possible. Is there any, uh, would, would central government get more involved? Is there any consideration about doing the membership drive in schools? I think that's where we need to start. If we have a membership drive, for example, on a healthy lifestyles um, for a term, for healthy lifestyles, and with that we can give free access to, which we've been doing anyway, to, uh, to leisure centers, to pools and for health, that would get the young people started. I think we need to invest some money in the young people. I know we don't have any money to spend, but we certainly need to start investing in our young people. Now we we have, to the best of my knowledge, some um, community had something to do with uh, weight loss, weight control already in. That could be part of it. We already send young people to the leisure center. That could be part of it. I think we need to do an overall. I wonder what Matt thinks of that. I know you're very new to Hereford. I have brought this up before with, with, with your predecessors, but I think it's simple where we have to start, quite frankly. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll have a hand up from Tina Dixon. Tina? Thank you, Chair. Um, it's really interesting listening to the conversations um, and, and absolutely obesity is, is far more than just an individual obesity. It's, you know, there's a, there's probably a lot of evidence to say that it's it's, it's linked to family obesity, isn't it? And, and activity as well. So it's, it's a much wider piece. Um, I'm, I just wanted to ask really, uh, Professor Paul Gately, uh, if this, in terms of a whole system approach, are there any um, examples where this is, you know, this has been their approach around obesity and what's working well and, and, and how that's, that, you know, the successes, I suppose, really? Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, Professor Gately, what, what's the evidence of, uh, uh, of uh, effectiveness? So there is there is emerging evidence uh, of this. The, the best evidence is in Amsterdam, um, and they started on this journey about ten years, about fifteen years ago, actually. And interestingly, they came and took all the best ideas from the UK and all the best ideas from Europe. And what they've done in Amsterdam is implement them. Um, and they have a population of about six hundred thousand people, and they, in their childhood obesity rates. I've seen dramatic reductions over over a 40 percent reduction in the last sort of eight years. So and what what they did uh, was, as I've said, they took all the best ideas from externally, uh, many of which were already being done in, in, in the UK, but not in a coordinated way and not in a concentrated way and not in a whole systems way. Um, Interestingly, in Amsterdam, just a, quite a, a different political way of working such that companies are on board and you know because of that uh, they saw dramatic shifts in the way retailers were working with their manufacturers and manufacturers of shape changed the size of drinks soft drinks cans and things like that was all part of the whole system working together collectively a lot of work with uh, the voluntary sector 
community community uh, growing uh, and food and physical activity. And whilst we have to appreciate Amsterdam and, and the Netherlands have been on a long journey for over 50 years in improving their sort of cycling infrastructure, they continue to move that. The point to note is that Amsterdam had very low levels of childhood obesity to start with, nearly a third of the, le- the rate of ours, but they still saw a 40% reduction. So, so I think there are examples out there in, in, in and across England, we are early days. There are, you know, there are a lot of local authorities putting these practices into place, but at a time when the system has been really difficult, you know, obviously the last five years has been very difficult with, with Brexit and with COVID and with so on and so forth. So it is early days, but a whole systems approach. I mean, I've heard colleagues talk about all the different things going on. What a whole systems approach does is have a record of all of those things and make sure that they're all part of the plan. Because if, if, we, if different groups are off doing different things, the alignment to the common goal for Herefordshire is missed. So it's about making sure that there is understanding of what's going on, i.e. We do, we do things called network analysis. So making sure that we understand who the stakeholders are and what they do, and that fits into a map. And so that's one piece of, of information. We then have a data uh, network where all the data that we know is brought together and people have the skill to do that. And then all the planning comes together in a sort of an overarching plan. So where there's, where there's absolute uh, alignment to primary goals of the common agenda of addressing obesity, they are obvious, but where there are sort of wider, more peripheral activities in planning or in mental health, we know about them, but don't see them as aligned to the primary goal. So it allows really good, uh, allows really good communication and alignment of efforts. What's critical is there needs to be the resource to pull all that information together, because often that disparate nature of really well-intended actions means the, 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 the alignment of everything is not as, you know, the sum of the parts is not as strong as it could be. And I think that's, that's one of the key goals of a whole systems approach is, is really what colleagues have been saying, bring the system together and get it working effectively together. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, going, I'm just going to take us back to I'm the right, question. I'd like to get an answer to my question from uh, yes, Matt. Yes, thank you, Councillor uh, it's going back to the question that Councillor Sons posed about investment in young people uh, activity early on. Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, we didn't really talk about that. We know that um, the, the early years of life and children is really important because we know obesity persistence is high. Once you become obese, it's incredibly difficult to get back to a healthy weight. And that's a really key thing. So I'm not saying we invest purely in children alone. There needs to be everything across the life course, but I think we should focus quite significantly in, in those early years. The key thing for me about offering all these free opportunities and activities, I think they are really important. We need to think about the value, the return on investment. We also need to be careful about universal services. So if we offer free things for everyone, it's normally, if we disproportionately uptake, uptake by people that may be more affluent and better off rather than those that may be uh, less up, off, up well off. Um, so we just need to make sure that if, if services are provided, we have to encourage uptake by those that are disproportionately affected, if that makes sense. Um, I, I don't know, a, long time, a long time ago, the government did the free swimming initiative, for example. So we need to think about, you know, that was buying down. But I think uh, my understanding from the evidence of that is that actually it is only those that people that did swimming in a way that carried on doing swimming rather than those that didn't. But wouldn't, wouldn't it make more sense though, to focus uh, support on those people, particularly young people who are already struggling with a healthy way? It doesn't really matter whether they're, you know, what, what the socioeconomic background of the family is. If, if, if what we're trying to deal with is obesity, then shouldn't the, uh, the, the, the activity, the, the health, the whatever is going to the, the young people who need it? Yeah, I'm probably thinking more from a preventative right. perspective. Preventative perspective. So I think there's something called the inverse care law, where when we put on services and initiatives, it's always the more well off that actually attend those services. You can actually widen inequalities. So we just need to make sure if we put weight management services on, we, we want those from you know that have been disproportionately affected from more poor backgrounds, ideally. Yeah, but then potentially you have a child who, who's obese, not being able to access services, uh, where a child that is not obese can. 
it doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, no, I'm not saying not, not to give them access, but we know there's more people who are overweight and obese from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. So it's just making sure we reduce those barriers and enable it and make sure they can actually access those services. Can, yeah, it's not, yeah, it's, I don't see it as an either or, but, you know, but I, I, just, I just would have thought that that, that, that actually what the individual uh, child or young person might be like would be a factor in whether or not they should be accessing services. Yeah, I'm probably not saying an either or, it's probably not coming across in the best way. But I think the key point is we need to make sure we proportionally support those people that, you know. Who are... Yeah, and I was going to ask you as well if we have any, any monitored outcomes from the Get Active and the um, Holiday Activity Funds work. Um, I know there was a lot of free access to the leisure centres and things. So do we know whether that had a beneficial impact, whether it's been carried over, or whether. Probably defer to Crystal, or as I say, no one's. <clears throat> So with the Get Active um, projects, we have an evaluation which will be um, due early November. So we will have an evaluation of the impact of those projects, um, but we don't quite yet. Thank you. I'd just like to finish up on this one, if you don't mind. Um, my main focus here was membership drive. Now, uh, and the other big focus was whole system. Now, we've been doing things sporadically. We've been doing diet, we've been doing exercise, but we've never brought a whole package together from what I've seen. And I think what we need to do, uh, I'm not suggesting you do it, Matt, but to go away and come up with a plan for the schools that we have a membership drive, that we get students to join this so we get all ages, all levels in this and put a package together that they can work on. So it'll cover teeth, obesity, the whole works for school, early school, and go to the school and say, this is what we've got to offer. It's free to those who are members, and we will follow each one of you along this. Now, NHS does this with diabetes, and so the, the stuff is out there. It's just that we need you, as the officers, to put this together so we have an all systems, not just one there, we'll try this, we'll try that, we'll try that and then try and bring them together and see what the results were. We need a whole result, if you don't mind. Anyway, that's enough from me. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sullivan. Councillor Tick, what's coming on the subject? Uh, just, to, just to go back on this um, uh, most deprived, less de least deprived, uh, well, we're, we're, we're on that issue. Um, and, and, and inevitably, as a, a councillor representing a city ward, um, you know, the, 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 the statistics for children, both in reception and at year six, there's a, you know, <clears throat> it's predominantly city wards um, and, and, and representing a ward where um, the levels of deprivation are particularly high. Um, I just wonder if, if either Matt or someone within the team could, could unpick um, the graph, it's figure seven, which shows that the referrals uh, to the health trainer's service is actually lower in the most deprived than in certainly in Q3. Uh, you know, you'd expect it to be lower in the in in the least deprived Q4 and Q5. But you know, most of my residents are probably in Q1 and Q2. And why are there fewer referrals for them than than people in the middle? It didn't seem to be logical to me. Thank you. Um, yeah, we very much try and target those particular areas um, of deprivation and we work with our colleagues looking at those areas and where to target. We are a very small team and we try to get out and do lots of community engagement in those areas so that we are encouraging people to access our service before they have to go to the GP. Unfortunately, at the minute, the majority of our referrals come through GPs and because we offer a stop smoking service as well, we have higher levels of people coming forward for stop smoking supports. So that means our, um, our work is targeted towards that. We haven't got the capacity to pick up and strengthen our work around our um, weight loss or obesity. We are working in terms of partnership now with our primary care network colleagues to try and strengthen that work and to look at um, how, how we can work closer with our health and well-being coaches or social prescribers to ensure that the 
um, targeted people are coming through to us um, when necessary. Um, we try to do a lot of community engagement work for targeting our food banks um, so that we're accessing anybody in those areas. We're trying to get health trainers out into those areas, but we are just one small part in this. There's lots of other um, areas around obesity that we've been talking about today that will have a part of that. Um, so it's, it's really, I'm hoping to strengthen what support that we can offer. Uh, with respect, it, it, it doesn't seem to be an explanation. I mean, if you look at the graph, you are referring lots of people, but twice as many people in, in Q3 are being referred as, as those in Q1. So it's not a question of capacity, um, more a question of, of, of targeting. And I, I don't understand why half the number of people who are greatest in need are being referred compared to people in, in the middle category. It's the page that's up three. Uh, yeah. 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 yeah, I was just going to comment. I think there's another dimension to, to that. And it's not as straightforward as are the right people being targeted to the right service and delivering on that. I think there's something here about the um activation of the individuals that have got obesity and the position they're in in their lives in terms of whether they'll engage with some of these things and we see this when we talk to the public around other things too so it isn't just about engaging with diet and weight um similar with things like drug and alcohol you know those people who are most adversely affected are often in more deprived areas with a lot more life challenges which really do inhibit the ability for them to engage and get onto that first rung of the ladder to get the support that is there and i think what i would say from a community point of view is that we almost have to invest our resources disproportionately to work with those people to because more work is necessary and coming to professor gately's um whole systems approach that's where it's really important that whatever is developed communities are part of not just the um, what is developed for them and done to them but actually that they're part of solutions where possible as well because if we're doing it at a very micro local level in these wards where we've got the issue of people engaging with the right help and support you're more likely to find the solution that works for them okay. yeah I just also want to say is that um, previously we would have, as health trainers, we very much tried to um, encourage self referrals. So we wouldn't have had over the you know previous years, we wouldn't have as many referrals into the service. However, as time has gone on, because there's no other services offering support, it means that with GPs, hospital refer into our service. So that clogs our time up and takes us away from being able to do that rich community engagement work through Christine with the partnership um, with our other colleagues. So it's, it's taken our time away from our community engagement when we could be targeting those specific areas and those specific people that we know are there. But because we get so many referrals into the service, then we're dealing with that demand and it's taken away from us being able to reach those people that we know we want to target and reach. We are trying to look at patient activation levels, as Christine mentioned, with our primary care colleagues to make sure that the right people are getting to us so that we're not spending time on picking lots of behaviours, lots of chaotic life signs, everything that's a barrier against them, putting in place their physical activity and making healthy choices. So we're trying to work closer together so that we get the right people through to us and then we don't get clogged up with those referrals that maybe necessarily could access self-help or online support or some of the other services. Uh, Councillor Jim. Yes, thank you. I'd like to go back, if we may, slightly to, to Matt's uh, original statistics, and uh, I'd be interested in as Gaten's view. Uh, can you tell me, is the situation getting worse and is it getting worse over what period of time? In other words, what are the stats? And is it getting worse in particular sectors? Because fundamentally, where I joined this committee this time, 
and said, well, the beast is probably one of the biggest things that's been a complete and utter failure with every policy that's ever been. No policy has yet actually achieved an outcome. It might have leveled off, but that might even be natural selection almost. Uh, is it a case that we, how do we measure overweight? How do we measure obesity? Are we consistent in what we do? Are we comparing apples and pears with different systems? And can we be sure that in any of these approaches, how do we have the markers that say they are being effective? So how do the stats actually work? That's a good question, and I'll probably let Professor Gately help me out, and uh, he's revealed himself. But I'll start off to begin with. I think it's, it's a really good question. I think, from my understanding, it is getting worse, and it'd be interesting to go back to the foresight report that produced that, that map, because that did some quite um, worrying projections in terms of what obesity would look like in 2050. But my understanding is getting worse in terms of how we measure obesity. Um, for children, we use percentiles, which we know were developed in the 1990s, so we can actually see quite clearly that obviously the higher proportion of children are becoming more overweight. And I think we're seeing that with adults. We're also seeing, I think Professor Kate, you might be able to um, agree with me on this, we're seeing more people becoming more overweight, so morbidly overweight, which is another worry. That puts a lot of stress on the NHS, on social care. Um, Measuring whole systems approach, I think that's really challenging. I hope you, um, Professor Gate, you will be able to come in on that. But I think apples and pears, I think we're measuring it quite effectively through body mass index. I know there are issues with that, but at a population level, we know the body mass index is a fairly accurate assessment in terms of weight. Um, does that answer your question? But I'll defer. It, it, it does. As long as you're measuring BMI back in 1990 or whenever, in the same way as you're measuring BMI now, if you change it, then you've got to have a, you know, what's the comparator? So I want to try and make sure that whatever we're measuring, and we're looking at loads of statistics, we're actually sure that they're measuring the same thing in the same way, that we can be confident that that change is one that is yeah. a real change. My understanding is it hasn't changed, but um, Professor Gay, that we don't mind, I'll come to you just to make sure I'm right on that, on that position. You're, you're absolutely right. And uh, the council is very right as well that we need a consistent mess, uh, method. Uh, BMI is that consistent method. Um, there are always conversations about its absolute accuracy for individuals, but at a populational level, it's a very reliable tool. Um, the, the data is very clear. It is getting worse. Um, what we've seen in the last couple of years is there was a, a huge increase during COVID, which is unsurprising. Um, whilst that has gone down in the following year from COVID, it's still higher than it was two years before. The reality is, is 85% of children will maintain the weight that they reach. So COVID will have a very, very lasting effect. So that's important. The, the key thing Matt's outlined is that um, what we do know is that between groups, people living with obesity are getting heavier. OK, uh, and that's really critical because that will absolutely pressurize the health system um, and very quickly as well. The second point to note is that the, the, the gap between the more affluent, less affluent is widening. And that is the other point to note. So so and I can't I don't know the wards of Herefordshire, but it, but if you take London, for example, in the more affluent areas, they are actually seeing a leveling off or reduction of levels of obesity, whereas in the more deprived communities are seeing going up very consistently. So we can act and we can have impact. Um, but actually what we've got to recognize is that impact will be differential between the different groups. And that's again going back to why, why is personalized care really critical? Because if we understand individuals, we can align appropriate interventions to those individuals. And what systems approaches should do is think about those individuals in the context of the system and use system levers to support the populational but individual levels. And I suppose so. So I hope that answers the question that the problem is worse. It's worse in particular groups and deprivation and those already with obesity are the groups most at risk. And then there's also communities with more vulnerabilities. So if you have more vulnerable communities across Herefordshire, they're also at risk as well. Thank you, that's really helpful. One of the, the areas that, in which I've been involved uh, in the past 
it's become very apparent that people do not recognize in themselves obesity. In other words, they will always talk about the person across the room. She's overweight, he's overweight, but they don't actually understand that if they looked in the mirror, that same thing would be said of them. There seems to be a sort of block, if I may put it that way. The second comment I make is you don't get fat from fresh air. In other words, it's only what the energy is that you put into the body that creates something. So it, it, is it not the case of sort of metabolically input and outputs don't match related to work done? Therefore, the, the single problem is that in the recognition, and then from that, the recognition of what you're eating is actually going to make you fat. Is that too simplistic a message, or is that the sort of message that needs to be really rather, it's not so deemed politically correct uh, sometimes to talk in those terms, but that's fundamentally where it's uh, the, the problem lies. I'm happy to come on the first point. I mean, in terms of identification of being overweight, there's a lot of evidence now. I've talked about 67% of adults being overweight or obese, that that is the norm. So therefore, you know, that, that, that. And then the other thing, we know there's evidence that um, 30 to 50% of parents don't recognise their children as being overweight. We also know that clinicians don't recognise people from being overweight. So there is an issue in terms of identification and recognising that actually people aren't necessarily at a healthy weight and they need to do something about it, um, which is why one of the recommendations is how we raise awareness of, of people being overweight. I think it is complex. It is an in and out scenario in terms of metabolism, but... We know it's a lot more complex than that in terms of the commercial determinants of health. You go into shop to buy one, get one free, you go into a petrol station, it's layered with chocolate, you walk up to the checkouts. Um, so it's kind of how we enable individuals, but also create that environment um, that facilitates that healthy weight. One of the analogies I always talk about is they can go on a healthy weight program, you can lose lots of weights, but you're putting people back into that environment where they got overweight in the first place. And that's a real challenge we have. So that's kind of back to the individual responsibility also that kind of environment and commercial sector we all have to make that work work together thank you it, it is that recognition which is slightly bizarre when you think one of the other areas that we have a problem particularly through social media is uh particularly with young females who are concerned to make themselves slimmer with the recognition of that direction we have a sort of rather odd situation that slimness is something that's put out there in the media as the ideal. But the problem is overweight. And as you've said, the recognition now that normal is now actually overweight, which is a sort of frightening uh, headline, isn't it? If you reach that point. Right. It is such a very enormous topic. and. Um, the numbers are huge, really. I mean, and also the years live with it. Because, for instance, coming on to the strokes, you know, that seems to kick in at 60 and its rates per thousand. This is kicking in by age four and its rates per hundred. And we've got 600 severely overweight children in our primary schools. And I'm slightly depressed by the figures on page 32 where it shows, for instance, that what used to, that in 2019, what people used to eat before the fruit, now we're really pleased if that's what they eat afterwards. So what used to be the baseline from which we were going to improve is now a success in terms of what people are eating after an in intervention. And also in the diagram below that, it shows that the number of extra exercises that people are doing is, again, you know, getting smaller and smaller, which shows either, I suppose, that the interventions aren't very effective or just how very different it is. And I know it says somewhere about the group, and I was a bit mystified that swimming world, and it's, you know, it's ill can't in there. I know they tend to attract people who, in general, that seem to be that overweight, but that group dynamic is and also could slimming well be improved a bit with you know a bit bit more foresight um because that is squarely in the in the sort of paid for sector and they seem to be doing 
but only they could find a way of reaching men. They grew occasionally, and the, the Herald Times had a lovely man the other day who'd got wonderfully. <laughs> but anyway, and the other question is, is there a kind of sweet spot with age? Like, for instance, you used to go, oh, well, it's puppy fat. I mean, is it literally when you're two, and if you put on weight when you're two, that's it, and you're however you're going to get? Or is there another spot when you're 10, 11, when you're shooting up in height? And you know, is, is there another chance then? Because it, it does, yes. That if if eighty five percent of people go on being the size they are, then it, it, it's, that that does seem a high number. Well, I'll, answer your second point, maybe, I'll answer your second point. Maybe Philip might want to come in on your your first point. I think I think there's multiple opportunities across the life course where we might want to intervene. There's certainly evidence in terms of those early years, uh, weaning, breastfeeding, all those kind of things have an important part to play. We know from the NCMP data, the National Child Measurement Programme data, which is the most robust data source in the world for obesity, between reception in year six, obesity prevalence approximately doubles between reception in year six. So, they, so in my view, I think the early years are important. And then that, that primary school, something clearly happens between the ages of four to five and 10 to 11. So understanding that, and I think there is a potential opportunity within Herefordshire around the school program a healthy schools program that you talked about that's something we don't necessarily have there's lots of good work going on but we don't have a healthy schools program as such we also know about life transition points um you know if, if people lose their jobs um if they get pregnant uh, it's not inevitable you gain lots of weight but there are opportunities where we could intervene where we know people might be more at risk so it's not a simple answer i think but certainly the early years in children is a really good opportunity as i said earlier once people are overweight or obese very difficult not impossible it's very difficult to turn back to that healthy way. I don't know if you want to come in on the first. Yeah. Um, we focus on four key areas with people when they come to see us, um, and that would be healthy eating, um, physical exercise, smoking and alcohol. So we're very um, client-centred. So the clients choose their own goals, and, and part of that will be working towards could be a healthier weight, it could be increasing the physical activity. So they're very small measures. Um, we support people within a 12 week period. So again, it's quite small time scale. So we're just the beginning of the journey for that person. Um, we do offer follow up appointments, but that again, that's client centered, whether they want that support or not. So we're just taking a snapshot at that point of their lifestyle. So I think with more investment into, into the service, so we could have increased capacity, we could see larger groups of people we could offer longer term support but at the minute we haven't had we haven't had that investment into the service um we've had other um restructures covid different impacts on the service over the years it has meant that we haven't been able to fully strengthen the service and offer wider term support and again it's just that small part that beginning of the journey for that person taking into consideration all the other barriers that get in the way from that person making that um, behavioural change. So it is very difficult, it's very challenging, and as we've talked about today, there's lots of other factors that play into that as well. Just a quick question. Breast said babies don't grow on weight, greater as children. True or false? Breastfeeding is a good way of avoiding it early years. So, 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 so breastfed, sorry, breastfed children Should don't put babies on are do not put weight on at the same rate as those who are on formula uh, in the in the next following years. True or false? Uh, I don't know if I have the information to hand to answer that. that's not true or false. Look at the data and evidence or not. Um, it's certainly often said, and I mean it would seem to be a very if if it's a truism. This is a problem. We've got myths. We've got, we've got stories, or we've got to decide what is, what's true, what's not, and then we can concentrate on them. And if that's true, then obviously through our midwife service, through our health visitor service, through our antenatal service, we've got a really important message point at which yes. we can start to get something in there, take up particularly with the point that's made about the early years. Uh, it seems to me that if that is something there, that wants yeah. emphasise that. I think there's some evidence that breastfeeding um, is beneficial in terms of the child's weight, but also for the mother as well. Yeah. But, but also, we know that if people, children are weaned early, 
that can also contribute to excess weight as well. So it's kind of potentially a combination of the two. So we've, we've got two messages there, wean later and uh, breastfeed, is that it? Yeah. I mean, you know, these are the sorts of messages which we might be able to use, and it seems to me with the various programs, these are important because the point you're making is that little bits along the way might have an overall effect. I mean, it seems to me that if we haven't got a schools program, there's an obvious uh, gap in our approach. Maybe one of the biggest problems we have in the county is usually traffic around schools. Maybe we should make sure the last mile is always walked. So no children are delivered to a school gate, they're always delivered a mile away. You know, I mean, there are things that you could actually start to be, I mean, it might sound a little radical, but on the other hand, if genuinely that will work, then that is surely the sorts of things that we should be looking at. Absolutely, and I think that the way you framed it then, a cumulative effect, I think that's quite powerful because it is all those little bits of interventions and changes to behaviours that would likely have that overall population impact. So, yeah, absolutely agree. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, and but surely this is the point you know, when we start to have a strategy, maybe a school's version of strategy, so that suggestions like that don't get lost, but they do get action. And maybe because I think there's a thing called school bus, isn't it? As possibly called the word that they've cycled to in a safe way. Yeah, that way. anything's got to be better than dropping a child off at the school gate, but in terms of the activity, physical activity, that child. Um, so, Councillor wants to come back. Just while we're on, <laughs> well, just while we're on myth busting, um, and it may be Professor Gately may be in a better position to answer this than Matt. And this is a myth I have to say I have used myself. Um, are there are there stages in life when it is easier and harder to lose weight? I've certainly used the well as you get older, it does get harder to lose weight. Is there any substance in that? Or um yeah, you know the chair agrees with me. And, and, but but I mean, you know, blow away this myth while while we've got an expert or two in the room, please. Well, I think we have a hand up on the screen. <laughs> 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 Yeah, th thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, ju ju just to clarify that, yeah, there is a nice guidance about diabetes in pregnancy and, and the value of, of breastfeeding. So I've just been looking at that. And, and in terms of um, the longer term, you know, weight reduction or, 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 or healthier weight for the baby. Um, but, but I'd also like to come in around, we, we talked about, you know, mapping some of the assets that we are, the some strengths um, that we have in, in Herefordshire. Uh, and, and one area that comes to mind is actually there's a, there is a, a park run that has recently started a, a junior park run on a Sunday in Herefordshire. It's not very well attended at the moment. It's free. Um, it's it's very you know it, very accessible um, and it's great fun. Uh, and um, you know it, it can actually be a family activity because obviously um, adults um, you know they're, they're always asking for people to support and, and volunteer to to make sure that that, that uh, event runs really really smoothly. So it can be a, a family um, affair if you like. Um, but, but I think there are, uh, you know, that's just one of the assets that we do have across Herefordshire that we, you know, is, is probably very easily accessible, L links with improving, act, you know, in, in improving activity as well. But um, so I think whether that's perhaps a good starting point in that trying to understand what what we do have um, that can help this, um, you know, but with with no cost at all. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Jim. Just quickly to come back because there's potentially another is it a myth or not. Um, exercise the amount required to remove weight is quite considerable is that and, and it needs to be kept up it's very good for health let's not muddle the two things and i appreciate that you get improved lung and heart function as well but actually the amount of work you need to do to to lose burn on calories is quite considerable yeah, I'll answer that question and I think I'll go to Professor Gately to pick up your question about the myth busting. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. It does take a lot of calories and, and it is primarily down to food intake, I think, that is driving the obesity epidemic. I think we, we probably have to be um, clear with that. But I do want to make the point, which is something I'm incredibly passionate about, another area is physical activity. I think often we see physical activity that sits under the umbrella of a bit of obesity, but actually physical activity in its own right is really beneficial for you. Yes. Okay. Even if you're overweight and obese, the, the benefits are immense. So I just want to make that point. But, I, I wouldn't for one moment wish to, to, to have away from that point. I think there's a tremendous evidence that mental health is actually improved by physical activity. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of benefits. But I think it is often thought that undertaking a quick trot around the park 
is going to help to reduce weight. It, it will definitely improve your mental well being and improve heart function and so on. But really, we've got to do some sort of work to, to shift uh, significant uh, fat levels. So that goes to Professor Gage, you'll come back in you said this Okay, yeah, sure. I mean, fundamentally, any any habit, the earlier a habit is formed and the factors that support that habit, the likelihood it is to continue. So in the context of are there critical periods, those critical periods, the earlier, the better. So as as somebody that is moving into his older years now, you know, I it, it, it is difficult, not just physiologically, but socially environmentally, family, all of those different factors make it harder to shape lifestyle in the future, whereas at a younger age, it is easier to shape it. Um, and so, so I would argue that those critical phases are not necessarily influenced by underlying biological factors, but they're more influenced by social, emotional, psychological, and environmental factors. So, so in a sense, that, that, that takes us back to all the great work that's going on, that there are a lot of ways in which we can intervene. And listening to the conversation, what's, what's really critical is um, all the stakeholders on, on this call all recognize that it is complex um, and that the job is how do we prioritize um, the, the, the efforts that meet the needs of the population. And, and I think coming together and rather than thinking about does X intervention work or Y intervention work, the question is, is what works best for Herefordshire with the resources and the goals and the strengths? And that to me is, is the absolute critical. And no, you know, Amsterdam's doing it well. You know, it, it's not about are you behind, are you ahead? It's about where are you at? And are you able to corral all your best efforts in a singular direction? That will be the difference between those local authorities that in the next 20 years, and we're not talking about obesity being resolved in a year's time or two years time. We're talking 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So the legacy from this meeting will be around, in my mind, how do you corral all the fantastic work going on embrace some of it and drop some of it what's working for your communities and what you can move forward on and, and I think that rather than looking at individual actions because they can be undermined by other individual actions it's better to make sure that there's a coherent plan in a certain direction it's well supported but it's recognized that there are strengths and weaknesses to it and working within the resources available and moving forward within those parameters to achieve the outcomes necessary. Thank you, Professor Getty. And a number of uh, people have mentioned this kind of you know, specific strengths and weaknesses of Herefordshire and what a lovely county it is to live in and so on. So, and I would just like to take a, a moment here to look at the kind of rural versus urban uh, dynamic of Herefordshire. Um, so, with the Get Active um, Fund, was that sort of roughly evenly split between urban and rural areas? Um, it was split between um, various projects. Um, so, yes, um, but it also depended on what the project was. So there were uh, a whole different number of projects that were had funding from the COVID recovery funds, um, and each project had it, had its own outcomes um, and priorities within it. So, I mean, what does yeah. that mean? There was obviously quite a big uptake of the free access to leisure centres. Which, which is actually something that we might you know, learn from. Um, but if we don't have leisure centres in the countryside, we've got fields, you know, cows and sheep and potatoes. Um, so, you know, how does that translate? And the particular thing, and this is again sort of looking at access to um, activity in the countryside, uh, it's usually on our public rights way network. That's something that the council do, public rights away. But for a lot of people they can't get on the public right away because they can't get over the style without you know risking breaking a hip or something so because a lot of the stars are substandard and frankly that they're, they're high and they're difficult to clamber over and a lot of people only walk because they've got a dog and the dog can't get over the stars so they don't go on a walk but so these are all really really basic things that you can't access the footpath that's 
next door to where you live because there's a stile at the start of the footpath. And that's something we could do something about as a council. So my suggestion is, or my recommendation to, 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 the, to the executive would be, could we please look at this and think, is there some way that we can uh, look at our uh, rules around replacing a style with a style and say, no, we won't do that anymore. We will only replace a style with a, a more easy form of access, even if it's a style with a portcullis to encourage uh, dogs. Because dogs encourage people to walk. You know, right, we also encourage dogs to walk. But it, it gets people out and about straight for their mental health and well-being. But it's also really important to walk. Um, so, and, and that's, we don't have a leisure centre. We don't have, you know, a cycle track or a gymnasium. What you've got is public rights of way. And we need to improve the access to that. So I, I would like to uh, suggest that as a recommendation. Um, yeah, just along the lines of improving access to public rights of way to make them more, more, more uh, usable for the less able. Um, and that would include people who are obese, who would just simply struggle to get over the style. So even if they're trying to do the right thing, they're going to really struggle. I think we need to help them. Um, and the other thought I had about this kind of continuing this free gym access and something, do we, oh, does anybody know, do we, do we continue that for our care leavers in any case up to 25? Mm -hmm. So I would, I would then, as a corporate parent, I make that a recommendation that that we that the, the executive consider um, free free access to leisure centres for care leaders up to the age of twenty five. If we don't already, uh, if we don't already do that, um, if that's possible. Um, Councillor Scrimpenhouse, I was yeah. struck by. Um, I mean, eight hundred and fifty thousand pounds was quite a lot of money, and I know to get a park run started, it costs. I think four thousand or something to um, you have to pay four thousand for the National Park Run Society, and I, I'm just wondering again whether we might be able to find some funding for getting started if there was an active local group prepared to do park runs because we do own quite a lot of green space and. Uh, it is a successful model that it's already existing. Yeah, I'm happy to look into that and explore. I think that's sort of a real good opportunity in the park run. I think it's been hugely successful, like you say, with very little resource. So I don't know what the local landscape is around that. Obviously, we've worked with somebody like Christine in the voluntary sector to understand how we could support setting this up. Just on your point, Chair, about the, the styles, I think. That'd be something that might get born out of a whole systems approach and actually listening and working with people in those rural communities to actually understand what are the barriers that you know you're coming up against and i think that's where it's really important to get the voice of those communities so, so we can try and resolve some of the issues also simple things like making sure the signage is is correct as well yeah there's lots of quite basic stuff that we could do better that would help i think um yeah and um so I'd, I'd like to hear from our, one of our witnesses from ICS, just quite a broad question. Um, how can we join up uh, seamlessly? How, how can we both mesh with kind of tier one, tier two, tier three approach uh, a, a, as far as the ICS is concerned, or the RCB, sorry. We'll take that. Hi, thanks, Chair. Um, I think I agree with lots of the, the previous comments here. We um, recognise that this is an important issue um, and it requires an integrated whole system approach to to making an impact. We are already working together um, with our public health colleagues looking at tier one, two, three and four. Um, I think co-production is key here, though. Um, we need to be working with local people to understand what the barriers are, understand um, where we haven't got uptake of services as we would like or as we would expect. As you'll all be aware, there was an NHS commitment through the long term plan to obesity and number of actions identified as part of that. So we are um, continuing to work, um, work on that. Um, there is increased demand for services at, as as has been referred to earlier in today's meeting. 
Um, I think the final thing um, with my, both my prevention and personalised care hat on um, that I'd like to say is that we, we need to appreciate that a one size fits all approach doesn't work um, and we need to ensure that we are meeting people where they're at um, um, and meeting people's needs um, in a way that works for them. And I think um, Professor Gately referred to that um, earlier too. I've noticed um, my colleague Anna has, has wanted to come in as well. Thank you very much. I think that observation about one size fits all uh, not being right, but it's absolutely uh, spot on. Um, Anna, so. Um, yeah, echo obviously what Emma has said. Um, I think we are very supportive of a whole systems approach and working with our um, colleagues around that and very much focusing more upstream on, on the prevention side of things, which we're trying to develop work um, with PHE, um, sorry, with public health on that. I would um, also like to echo thoughts that we should take an all age approach to this. We've obviously got um, an issue across um you know a, a big proportion of the population within Herefordshire and also the adults impact very significantly on the behaviors and the um, availability of access to the infrastructure that children and young people grow up in so I think it needs to be an all-age strategy not just focused on any on the younger end although obviously we want to you know really influence um and improve the state of um way within that population group as well but i think it needs to be an all-age strategy great um and i was thinking probably we could take some learning maybe from the um get active and the whole activity fund and these pieces of work we've already done to inform a strategy going forward in terms of what works what doesn't work what are the gaps um, and, and about embedding change, it's the other thing. I, 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 because of this kind of weird funding model of sort of blob of money comes through, you spend it. I, I'm never really convinced that we embed change, whether we just uh, we just do something jolly for the summer and then everything goes back to normal. Um, and a strategy might help to get that more structured and embed change. And the other thing I was thinking, because of the kind of stop start nature of some of the funding, that if we have a strategy that, that actually pipelines, things that we think, oh, that's a good idea, whether it's the miles of school or whatever, that, that, that we can then be prepared, you know, as and when we have funding. So if something's being held up simply by resources, that doesn't mean say it can't go forward as this is what we would like to do. And it, then it's more, the, the thinking's been done at any rate, that, that, that would seem to be worthwhile. Um, and the other thing is putting in place uh, as with the response to the to get active, whatever that we've got robust monitoring, so we know what works when it works. That's the other problem, isn't it? So, um, and I'd like to see that as kind of part of the part of the whole um, Thanks, Jen. Um, just to pick up a, a point that Tina Dixon's just made about the gaps and the tears. I mean, in, in some respects, uh, the slide flatters to deceive, really, doesn't it? Because um, the report suggests that certainly for a tier three and tier four, we have nothing to offer children. Um, and that for adults, um, the only provision is in uh, to be referred to Gloucester. So um, I mean, Tina asked, you know, what would be one of the barriers be? Well, I would have thought straight away, having to be referred to Gloucester was a, was a, a major barrier, particularly if you live in the Northwest of the county. Um, so I just wondered, you know, are there any are there any plans to improve that provision or indeed even put provision in, in place where, where none exists at the moment? Do you want to pick up on gaps of provision here? Tina, you've got your hand off that legacy hand. Yeah, it, it, it is actually a question, but uh, but obviously picking up on that, that, that point you've just raised, uh, that's just been raised, uh, um, we are, as an ICB, trying to um, understand um, our activity in terms of um, where our referrals are going from primary care. Um, and, and obviously the, there is provision in, in Gloucestershire, but uh, we, we are currently trying to, to understand that data a little bit better um, so that we, you know, we, we can actually, I suppose, well, it's, it's that baseline I think that's missing really. And that will help to drive um, you know, decisions around, well, is that provision solely from Gloucester or is that something that needs to be um, to come from uh, something more locally um, 
I, 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 I hope, hopefully that will answer your last question. Uh, no, I, I, I'm sorry, I may be being very dense, but I, in all honesty, I'm not really sure I understand any of what you've just said. What I said was that at tier three and tier four, there is no, there are no, there's no provision for children in the county at all. And for adults, the only option is to refer them to Gloucester. So firstly, surely that is a, a major obstacle, a major barrier. And what plans, if any, are there to improve the provision for tier three and tier, tier four within the county? Hmm. Uh, can, can I bring in my colleague, Emma, on that one, please? Because we have been working together on that. Put a hand up. Thanks, Tina. So, um you're right the, the pathway um, that that is in existence is to Gloucestershire um, for patients in Herefordshire however we do know that patients are also referred to Worcestershire um, based on patient choice um, that's not to say that um, that we wouldn't be able to consider um, options for um, provision within Herefordshire but that's something that we'll have to have to take back to the ICB um, to, to discuss further and, and we can provide updates at a later date and um, in terms of the provision for tier three for children um i'd like to bring anna our project manager for children in um because she's got some background on this thanks emma um so it, for tier three uh, tier three children um from across the region not just herefordshire can access what are called Q clinics, which are based in Birmingham and it's a regional service. And the reason why it's regional is because the numbers that would require that are so low that it is not effective to provide locally based services. So hopefully that answers the tier three question that the services are there, but just not locally. And that is the same across the region. And in terms of our current knowledge around young people who need um, tier two services, what we are seeing is that we have got children who are being referred, but not necessarily appropriate referrals because the level of um, being overweight or obese is not yet impacting severely on their medical needs that requires that level of intervention. What we do know is that we've got a gap between the universal tier one services and tier two, where we need to improve our provision um, and would usually look to um, school nursing services and health visiting to provide that but actually because of low capacity in in those particular professions at the moment we're struggling to provide that service so what we're doing is trying to put in some other provision more in a kind of family coaching approach at that sort of 1.5 slash tier 2 um level in order to target those people who wouldn't ordinarily access services so that really difficult to reach group so we're working towards that at the minute we're quite we're not too far away from putting that into practice uh, but yeah we do we do appreciate that we need to look at the um, workforce in terms of delivering that sort of lower tier levels of provision so hopefully that's um, answered that question um, for you Thank you, yet. I mean, basically it feels like there are gaps and at the moment we're not able to be doing anything about it at all, really. But that, but to show you that kind of uh, looking at gaps and working together with our uh, partners at the NHS and that our strategy to so trying to join it all up is the best way of, 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 of meeting the need as far as is practical given resources and other uh, other issues. Once you become a patient, you've actually failed. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the yeah. key, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's absolutely the point. Isn't it? Yeah. I know Professor Gately has got his hand up as well, but it's just a, just a point on tier four for children. That, that's yeah, normally it's very rare. Yeah, so yeah that, absolutely. That's no, I, so right. I just wanted to make that point. Yeah. I think there are clear gaps in our tiers, yeah, really, particularly in psychologically led yeah. service. I know a lot of uh, when I commissioned tier three adult weight, I actually commissioned the Gloucestershire service, funny enough, many years ago. Um, and it needs to be psychologically led because actually a lot of the patients they saw, they actually experienced trauma in childhood, which actually led to some of their morbid obesity rates. So it's very complex. Uh, and that, that, that feeds back into the whole trauma formed approach, which, uh, which is really interesting as well. So, yeah, the other thing about child weight management services, and, and Paul might want to come in on this, is often the uptake to those services is really low. 
um, and it does need a whole family approach, but often you can put on all these services and interventions, but families just fail to uptake that. So if we weigh and measure children in school, we tell their parents their children are overweight, often they don't necessarily want to do anything about it, we'll go to those services. So it's a point, it's a challenge that we want to overcome as a service to understand that a little bit more, get parents involved, um, but it's something we, we, we want to do. But. I think also there's something around clustering and the whole systems approach, whole family approach, upstream, and also where you get behavioural clusters, smoking, drinking, and obesity within a family. And, and the, so and this again goes a little bit to this idea, do we, do we put our resources far and wide or we do identify where you need to really focus? And that, that's again sort of something that I would like to see in a, in a strategy, some, some balance of investment there. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's absolutely right. The clustering um, is the objective of whole systems because it's about getting clarity and then acting on that clarity. Uh, so everything that's been said on that is great. I just wanted to, one point of clarification around tier three for children. Um, one of the crew clinics absolutely is a right is a program by NHS England, but it is a pilot for three years and it's very, very restricted. And the objective is not weight management. The objective is the medical management of the comorbidities of obesity. And they're two very different things. And NHS England are really clear about that, which is why the numbers are so small, because the sort of at the current physio, the current physical health comorbidities of those children, Anna's absolutely right, they're, they're less prominent. But the reality is, in England, 450,000 children would, would be typically accessing a tier three. And I don't know how that plays out in Herefordshire. But, you know, we... For, for some time, we've moved away from interventions on, on childhood obesity. And it's it, for me, it's been a real backward step. And we probably, when you look at numbers and you look at impact, it would be justifiable to have a tier three service in every local authority and indeed every ICS in the country. Now, whether the local politicians or the local clinical decision makers decide on that as a course of action against other priorities is obviously for them to consider but when you look at a numbers and a need perspective a tier three would be needed in every local area in the country thank you for speaking that sounds yeah it's very yeah, thought provoking um so i'm going to start winding this uh discussion up now i have uh, council marshall to come in um and it's really a practical point that you've drawn a lovely straight graph yeah. of tier one, tier two, tier three, and tier four. And truthfully, it would be helpful to grasp actually roughly how many people were in each cohort. Because if it's five in tier three, you know, that clearly is different to if it's 400 and if it's 105,000, or indeed the entire population in the bottom. Just be a little bit in the on that. Councillor Sellers. No, it's okay. Carry on. <laughs> Yeah, just, just a, a, a sort of side comment that whole systems approach, but can I also plead for a one health approach? 36% of dogs are overweight, 17% uh, are morbidly obese. Uh, same is true of rabbits, pet rabbits, same is true of cats, and the same in the last survey I saw of uh, ponies. So obesity is not just a human problem, it's actually Western man's problem with their pets, uh, with those that they share their lives. Uh, so it is a case of perhaps a one health approach as much as a, a, a systems approach. Okay, um, and is, Professor Gate is still on the call? Yeah. I am indeed. Yeah, oh, just because I, I realize you have to go and, we, and we'll be uh, winding up with this subject. Is there anything else that you feel that we should be? looking at in terms of a recommendation or something that Herbert could, could do differently? No, I think it's been a great conversation with some brilliant insight on, on, on all fronts. So thank you for inviting me and involving me. Okay. I think we'll, we'll take that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for attending and for your, for your, for your brilliant contribution. It's much appreciated. Uh, right, so I'm going to turn now to uh, Council Hitchner, the Leader of Council, for any comments you might wish to make. Uh, well, thank you very much. It's, it's quite eye-opening, I think, for me. Um, 
And the idea of one system approach, I get it's, it's from, from birth to, to, to death, how it's dealt with. And I, I happen to have a daughter who's uh, six weeks, uh, had a baby six weeks ago. Uh, and uh, her, her baby is sort of the, the lower, lowest quartile in weight. Um, and, um, and, and so she's been, she's worried being worried by the health workers to say she's got to put on weight <laughs> and, and 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 why why you know if she was the top if she was the 90th quarter or whatever oh, oh, that probably that doesn't sound right but <laughs> that, that's other end. so she was, quite, she was really healthy as far as, and, and, and really quite heavy you know the, the, the health workers say oh that's fine you know she's nice and healthy and and so it's not it, and my daughter is a clinical psychologist so she's not stupid and and uh, she she she's uh, she feels under pressure from the health workers to for her, her baby to put on weight and to stop breastfeeding and actually supplement it with some <laughs> bottle feeding. No, it's not in not in this county. But <laughs> my, but my kind of question is, you know, where, where where are we as a kind of health service and with with, with, with children in terms of care and that kind of thing and, and the the people who are providing the training because it's their examples which are going forward. So so that's that's the the, the, the child now. I have a child who's a, 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 a primary school teacher, and the amount of sport that goes on is is, is minimal in, in schools, I think. And, and the number of teachers who are involved in teaching the children who go out and do the sport is is minimal. I think he's he's head of sport, and he's virtually the only one who actually gets out there and and is involved with um, with the children because he's it's part of his role. But the other teachers sit back. And I think that that again is 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 that something we should be working on? Uh, and then I then I go through to sec secondary school, and where I was a governor at the age of eleven, you know, you'd have participation of seventy or eighty percent. By the time you get to sixth form, it's ten or twelve percent over the period. So that all those things are being they're being taught by the by the by the, the leaders, by the teachers, by the, the social workers, by the the. Um, uh, People in attorney. So, so to me, this the whole system approach, I think that's what we're kind of saying. We're saying about all that bit and how people start is how they end up. That's a signal that I'm getting. So, we need to intervene early. Mm -hmm. It may take 20 years before it's all change, but I think that's the sort of thing. And whether you come with any recommendations about that kind of thing. So, um, I've, I've been remaining quiet, just listening, and uh, it's been quite interesting to me. Thank you, Thank you uh, Chair. Thank you, Lita. Um, yes, and I think that actually what you were saying earlier that touches on the idea about whether we're talking about obesity in terms of strategy or healthy weight. Um, and, and I think that's something that we should definitely uh, consider because it would be wrong to give the impression that the thinner you are, the better it is. There's healthy weight. Um, right, okay, so committee. Um, Catherine Report has got a recommendation uh, which is in your agenda and the recommendations at paragraph 11 of the report uh, from the Director of Public Health, which I, I think are all very uh, appropriate for our discussion. If anyone's got any, I don't want to do more of many of that, you say. And then we will have some specific recommendations, I think, that will come forward during the discussion. Uh, which will require a response from the Council of the Executive uh, or from the ICS or to the nature of the recommendation. <coughs> so, yeah, I think, we, I think we need to, yeah. So, should we take a moment to do that? Yes, I think we take a moment to go through some of the recommendations. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so the proposed resolution is that the proposals outlined at paragraph 11 of the report, which is paragraph page 39 of the agenda pack, considered by the committee, be endorsed and referred to the cabinet and uh, NHS ICB for consideration. Um, along with a summary of the evidence concerned and observations of the committee. 
I take Councillor Swindlehurst's point and also the point we haven't gone through about the right sort of language and would, would a healthy weight strategy be in fact a, a better title than an against the strategy? I'm not quite sure what, I, what yeah, the I, okay terms I, are. I, 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 you know, I think so. I think that would be what I would like to yeah. ask for, but it's up to the executive as the language that they choose to use. Sure. The end of the day. But, but I, think it's important. I think that's a very important point because the moment you say to somebody they're a beast, the, the, the shutter comes down. Actually, talking about how can we grow more healthy and yeah. help the earth has a positive spin on it. The moment you've been, language is really important about this. It's how people see themselves, how others see them. And actually, to be, if somebody says, Well, I'm feeling better, I'm feeling healthier because I've done, they don't say, Actually, I'm no longer obese because I've done. Yeah. You know, the language is really important around this. Mm -hmm. So, getting it in there in the first place, let's call it, call it what we want it to be. Okay. In, in that case, you, we, we, can the recommendation be that we are asking for a healthy weight strategy to evolve alongside the health and wellbeing overarching strategy to bring the detail and to try to coalesce these various activities and things that are going on at all levels and all ages so that we have a, 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 a whole systems joined up approach. Which is that one? Yeah, which we'll say put one chair on you mentioned the robust monitoring. Yeah. To, to ensure the council and NHS healthy weight strategy yeah. include key measures to measure and evaluate the impact of the strategy over time. Okay. Mm. Yeah, so that's uh, did, uh, probably didn't hear that with the recommendation. Um that there's robust monitoring to ensure that the council and our NHS partners uh, in the uh, healthy weight strategy include key measures to measure and evaluate the impact of the strategy over time. I think that's essential, isn't it? Always? How do we know when, mm -hmm. when we're getting anywhere with it? Do, do we think it's possible to put um, sort of way markers into that? Is it, other, is it possible to have targets around this as a, uh, an incentive to try to? To, to move this as a subject. If we have the statistics of how many people are deemed overweight, how many are these, should we actually be to I mean, national, uh, are the national statistics as target on this? So how much of your population should, we well, already heard that Herefordshire is overweight uh, generally. You know, I mean, even if we got it down to national average, we'd be doing good. Or something. <laughs> you know, I mean, it seems to be that that there should be something there that, that says in five years we wish to see it. I think uh, overall there's a data quality issue as well, locally. Um, so I don't know what the idea is, because how would we address the data quality and, and benchmarking and and measuring success? Yeah, difficult one. I'm trying to search my brain in terms of what the national policies are. My colleagues can have. They did set a target nationally. I'm not, I'm not convinced those are at the moment. I mean, it's really difficult, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. even if we try to align with the national average, which would be a positive step, that still means there's work to do. So um, I think maybe achieving something towards you know aligning with the national average would be a sense as well as that doesn't target to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the challenge. Can we have some action before we start, please? <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's all very well coming up with things to look at and data, but until we do something, we're not going to accomplish anything and there won't be any data. So I think we need to also focus on what we're going to be doing, not what on the action that should be done. You know, this data stuff is all very well. It'll come by itself. Once we start doing something, then we can take the data and look at it and see if it matches the rest of the data in the, in, in the country or in the world, whatever that is. But if we don't take action, we're not going to accomplish very much. So I think all this is, I can't even see where we're going with it. I mean, if I, could, if I could share it, if the recommendation is a healthy weight strategy, which is formed by a group, then that should, they should consider, I guess, what that target could be as part of that work uh, and set those outcomes and set the outcomes to achieve. Thank you. Am I right that some of the particular ideas that have been mooted may be put up to the executive for consideration that are? The ones that are particularly more within the council's care. The class. Yeah, so that's what we're clarifying now. Yeah. That's going to be actually resolved upon. 
So so I, I would like a recommendation that the executive see if there is any way to make public rights of way access easier for those who are less able and to make walks specifically dog friendly, maybe specific walks as opposed to different generally, um, uh, by using court colour styles and kitten gates. Well, what, what can we do for yeah. that? Councillor Jimman's idea about the and the last one, and, and then for me, and, was, and that was a, a part of our healthy schools. Yeah, the last mile strategy or the last uh, part strategy, or whatever you want to call it. But it does seem to me we have always have a huge problem with transport, traffic, and dropping off at school. Well, let's move move that point away to somewhere. Uh, the last part is always a walk to school. Now, there's going to be exceptions, there's going to be difficulties, but it's the principle, isn't it, that we try and get across. Certainly, at the moment, I'm only aware of the park run in Herefordshire and the secret park run we've been heard about. That I don't know where it is, but in the market towns, that might well be a very good boundary intervention. And uh, the, the, the other recommendation is free gym up to oh, Kelly. 25 for Kelly. Kelly. Mm. Yeah. Can, I, can I just put a question which was the point was made about specific support and is there something when you look around all of you who are involved in this county where you're sitting there thinking I only wish the council would do yeah I mean let's toss this back to you you're struggling with this you're trying to do it you're working on Small budgets, don't say more money, please. Um, but yeah, uh, what, what significantly would enhance your ability to get the message over or to actually uh, get, get action that has outcomes? Christine, yeah, I think in bringing it back, back to Alyssa's comment earlier about blobs of money that are quite specific and unhelpful. Um, we can't always avoid that, but actually trying to ensure what we do develop with those blocks of money is as um, coordinated and sustained as possible, that we embed things with these initiatives. We just, as a community, we see so many pockets of things that crop up and it might be for a specific group of people, specific geographic area in a very limited period of time. It's quite hard to get your head around what's available then when it comes and goes so quickly and it's so specific. And I think there's something about how, how we look at funding more strategically mm -hmm. together, and, and that might come out of the whole systems approach. Yeah, If we put in the infrastructure, I still like the membership drive of schools, we need to get schools on board. I, I, I can remember my son coming home with all kinds of information on smoking and why I should stop smoking. I think we, our children are very powerful. Um, if we have them coming, going home with a message, I don't think they're getting that message in school from what I can gather right now. I think we should be looking at that. So it seems to me that we need, the other thing is if we do an infrastructure of what needs doing overall, get the, um, get the whole thing, then when those pockets of money come in, we know what will fit with that one if we, Put the money in there because it's it's in that that whole umbrella system. So we know what we want. So we need an infrastructure, a total infrastructure, whether we can whether we have the money or not. Just put it in place. This is what we have. Then as the money comes in, we'll feed it where it's needed, but also keeping in mind it's part of the umbrella. I think that's what we need to look at. There's an overall infrastructure of of that, maybe starting in schools, and when money comes in. Now I have four main, two main focuses, mental health in schools and mental health in the workplace. And both, if you get to both of them, you're gonna, uh, but I've had trouble taking the council along with me, I'm afraid. But if we get to those, then we're, we're getting somewhere. So let's put a package together, infrastructure together that, that feeds, that we can feed, that's all. Thank you. So we'll just pause right here. So just come back to Yeah, come back to the point. I think you're suggesting we need to do coordination. Now, we've got the ICB now, we've got the board, we've got three people who are on that. I think it's really important to understand who's taking ownership of this 
across it. Who's going to come? Who do we bring back in here, sit in a chair in six months' time and say, what have you done? What's different? What's progress? That's what we need. So who's going to be the person we're going to take that ownership? We can finish the thing we want first, which I thought was a good question. Sorry? Oh, asking if people would come. Because we don't want to start the debate while everyone's trying to get their information sorted. Yeah, actually, we can start the debate. Now, we're totally going to say, and I'm sure that uh, our, our colleagues uh, on the call here um, will uh, will come back at some point and tell us what's going on. But I think that's what we need to get a coordinated uh, conversation going. Um, to, 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 to start that. Um, so uh, what I'm going to propose now is that we adjourn because um, we have uh, different uh, people coming into the meeting for to talk about the scope of the agenda and it gives uh, it's a chance to just write down these recommendations to get all clear so we'll vote on them when we come back. Thank you. So welcome back uh, after the adjournment and uh, we now have recommendations for the committee to uh, vote on and agree, and um, I'm going to pass over now to start my the car to read them out. Thank you, Chair. And on behalf of the Chair, the uh, proposed uh, resolutions for the committee are in order. I have eight uh, to, for the committee to consider and vote upon. One, that the proposals outlined at paragraph 11 of the report, page 39 of the agenda pack, and considered by the committee be endorsed and referred to the CAPLA and NHS Integrated Care Board for consideration, along with a summary of the evidence uh, considered and observations of the committee. We'll vote on one at a time. So, can I have a show of hands all in favor of that recommendation? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. That Herefordshire Council and partners develop a whole systems healthy weight strategy to coordinate and deliver actions for improved health outcomes. All those in favor, be shown. It's unanimous. Thank you. That a healthy school strategy be included as a specific program to engage and involve schools. Yes. All those in favor, show. Can we take that a little bit further. I'd like to see it opened up a little bit more rather than just that title. We need to make sure that we're, we're going to be covering all areas, not just obesity, but well being, et cetera, et cetera, in that, that program. So we need, enough, we need to know what this is going to be set out in the program to suit rather than just obesity, I think. This is all about, you know, well-being is a big thing. So I think we need to make sure it's that we- It's a healthy school of perhaps sometimes it's not defined as obesity. Yeah, but healthy one. So it's, it is a very uh, umbrella term. Most people- So we they, include um, emotional, mental, most people, physical well-being. Most people think when they look at health, it's physical. It's, so it's still automatic physical, where we need to make sure that it's a well-being, mental well-being. Okay, so can we put a sort of subtitle to that too, including emotional, mental, and physical well being? Yeah, that makes more sense, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, all those in favor with that and uh, slightly amended, uh, slightly amended recommendation. Yes. Okay, you know that the council and NHS ensure that the healthy weight strategy include key measures to effectively measure and evaluate the impact of the strategy over time. Yeah, all those in favor, show, thank you. That the Get Active Fund program evaluation be used to help inform the new healthy weight strategy. Yeah, that was the name of the the free access to gym services be made available to care leaders up to the age of 25. Up to the age of 25. All those in favour? Okay. Elements. Does the council take measures to improve access to public rights of way in countryside for Okay. All those in favour? Okay. Elements. And that a health impact assessment tool be developed for use in planning policy to better consider potential impacts on health and well-being and planning applications. 
very yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes, you know that. Any other comments from committee? Yeah, you know. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Carl. Now we move on to agenda item number eight and uh, welcome some participants <coughs> who have come to contribute to this item. And I'll ask them to introduce themselves and uh, uh, their involvement expertise in this topic, just, just briefly so that the committee knows who you are and, uh, and what you do. Start with Mary. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for asking us to come today. My name is Mary Gay, I'm the managing director. For the integrated care board and on the integrated care system to stroke. Thank you. Um, don't we have John Barnes at all? Hi, uh, John Barnes, Chief Transformation Delivery Officer for One Herefordshire. Thank you. And Kerry. Hi everyone, thanks for having us today. I'm Kerry Doherty, I'm Head of Comms and in Communications and Engagement uh, at NHS Herefordshire and Worcestershire, working on the Stroke Programme Board to lead on the uh, patient, public and employee stakeholder engagement. Thank you. Uh, Anita Roberts. Uh, good afternoon, Anita Roberts. I'm Transformation Programme Lead for the ICS for Stroke. Um, leading on the transformation project across the stroke program uh, across the stroke pathway. Thank you. And uh, and finally, please forgive me if I get the pronunciation wrong. Uh, Girish Madigalda. Hello there. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. sorry. Hi, I'm Girish Mudegara. Apologies, my camera's just not working. Um, I'm the stroke lead services at Worcester Royal Hospital. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for being with us this afternoon. I'm going to invite Mary uh, to provide a brief presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'm going to base this discussion on the presentation that's been sent out to you. So give a bit of an overview, just as a reminder of what stroke is and the impact of stroke. And then why across our Hereford and Worcestershire integrated care system, we are thinking that we need, may need to redesign our stroke services to meet the needs of the population. So across Hereford and Worcestershire and Powys, because we're responsible for Powys for stroke as well, there are th three people that have a stroke each day. That doesn't sound massive numbers, but the impact of, on the individual and the family can be quite dramatic and you know, long lasting. And that number is set to rise with the ageing population. No matter what we do with prevention, there, will, there is likely to be more strokes, um, uh, people suffering strokes in the future. So we want those people to thrive, we want them to survive, we want to make the, the, get the services as good as we possibly can to give them the best possible chance of that um, across our ICS. So we have high ambitions for high quality stroke services and, and TIA, which is a, a, a mini stroke, we call it mini stroke, uh, across our system. And to achieve this, we've had a stroke programme board for some time now, quite a few years, we're moving across Hereford and Worcestershire, um, looking at best practice nationally and how we should be implementing that locally. Um, so we, we want to look at a case for change, a potential case for change, and how we develop potential solutions to help us deliver a better service. But at this stage, we are talking to our clinicians, we're talking to experts across the country, we're talking to other areas where best practice is being delivered, but we want to really talk to our public, our patients, people who've use the stroke services, families of people who use the stroke services and engage really well across our system to make sure that we haven't forgotten anything, where we are going in the right direction and that we get the outcome that we need for those people that have had a stroke. So on the next slide, um, you'll see there is a nationally mandated stroke pathway and this is based on best practice evidence and it's in five, five stages. Prevention being one of the main areas and, and our stroke programme board is doing an equal amount of work on preventing strokes with our population. I'm just listening to your previous discussions, you know, that is one of the key indicators of how we can help to prevent strokes in the future. But we're doing a lot of work, particularly with primary care, on what how they can support individuals and families and monitor the early signs of, of ill health that could lead to a stroke and how they can get in early and do some prevention. So there's a, a lot of focus on the prevention pathway. But then if, a, if an individual does have a stroke, 
the most important bit of this pathway is that emergency treatment, that first 24 to 48 hours. What happens to that individual in that time is crucial to that ability to give us a chance to thrive and survive a stroke. That is the most important aspect. Then there's the ongoing acute phase in a hospital and the treatment and care that an individual receives is, is really important to uh, uh, maximise their outcomes. And then stage four is, the, um, is rehabilitation. We need to rehabilitate those individuals to the best of their potential post a stroke to give them the best chance of life, um, a quality of life going forward. And then there's the community care and life after stroke. And that is both physical and psychological care that people need after stroke. Sometimes, like as an ex-nurse, I've seen this many times, the psychological aspects of having a stroke outweigh the physical problems, and we need to support them in that way. Behind that is there is a wealth of national, international evidence that, that backs up that national stroke pathway. And what we're trying to do is implement that as best we can across a seven day a week period, because that's really important that we have the same level of service seven days a week, 24 hours a day, particularly in that emergency treatment section, because that's where the, the best chance of outcomes come. So how do we provide services now? We have two acute hospitals across our ICS that provide stroke services, although we've got three acute sites. We've got the Alex Hospital in Redditch. Worcester Acute provides the stroke service and Y Valley provides the stroke service. We have a range of community hospitals that provide um, rehabilitation care after a stroke. We've got all our primary care networks, primary care involved in the the um, prevention work, as I've said, and the post-discharge work to support them. And then we have, you know, our council partners help us with the rehabilitation. We work in tandem to rehabilitate patients and the voluntary sector support the after the after care as well that we do. So we have a range of integrated services already providing stroke in our system. But we have some real challenges. We've had some challenges for a long time. We do not have enough permanent stroke specialist consultants to deliver the national clinical standards for stroke. Now, that isn't a problem in this area. That's a national and I believe an international problem as well. We have, you know, we are we have had challenges for quite a few years. And you know, sad to say, on a couple of occasions, we've become very close to be, not being able to deliver services in, in, in one part of our system. So we want to we want to look at the potential of a way of delivering services that meets all those standards I've talked about but gives us a much more robust way of doing that seven days a week. Um, at the moment, we are relying on, on support from outside of our ICS. Um, we got to a very difficult position. Uh, I think it was earlier this year, end of last year. It's all, and we had to seek help from the Birmingham, Black Country, Coventry, Warwickshire areas who, who did come and help us, which was you know, most welcomed to keep our services going. Um, but we are still reliant in some way on, on that support and as an ad hoc basis. And we want to be resilient ourselves in our own area going forward and to be able to prepare for the future. So um, we want to keep the, the services as locally accessible as possible um, for, for individuals. That We know that's important. We know that's important to, uh, to our population and to our clinical teams, actually. But we, we have to balance that with particularly those first 24 hours, what is best for that individual to have the, um, have the, the care that they need for stroke. Hopefully this is a once in a lifetime thing for individuals. The important thing is you get the impact of the care that you need. We want to improve our pathways also with, um, with our tertiary services. Tertiary services are the big, more complex centres. We want really strong relationships with Birmingham who provide some of the very highly specialised stroke care and other areas to make sure that patients can access them as easily as possible as well. So the next slide, we've been developing as a group, the Stroke Programme Board have been developing potential solutions. And I want to stress these are potential solutions at the moment. We are about to enter a phase of engagement, endorsement, you know, seeking further clinical views, further expert views, looking at how we can embed the new technologies that we can, we can have access to now, but making sure that we, we keep the focus on the right care and those patients thriving. So in 2018, uh, we did identify four potential solutions. And this was with the National Clinical Leave for Stroke, with the Stroke Network at the regional, so the highly, highly expert individuals we brought in to help us. 
And we did actually start engagement then. I don't know if many of you recall that. We did start some engagement at that time. And we did an option under options appraisal of potentially four solutions. Um, so the first was no change to the current service. Second one was having one hyperacute stroke unit. I'll just explain what that is. So, you know, that, that emergency treatment in that first phase after, after you've been diagnosed with a stroke and had that very initial treatment, best practice that you, that you are cared for in a hyperacute stroke unit by a dedicated stroke team over 24 hours. Um, so we would have one across the ICS and two ongoing acute stroke units um, in the local areas. The third, which was an option that we didn't really want to explore, but the national league said we, because of the fragility of some of our services, we, we needed to consider was taking stroke services out of Hereford and Worcestershire altogether and looking at the bigger centres and, and providing those services there. And the fourth option is having one, one of our hospitals having a hyperacute stroke unit and the acute stroke unit on one site. All of those, no matter what, the, 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 one of the key things was that you get the patient back to their local area for the proactive rehabilitation as soon as possible. Um, you know, I, I was always taught 72 hours, it could be longer than that, 72 hours in a hyperacute stroke unit, getting your initial uh, care and then rehabilitation back in your local area, either in your own home, if that's appropriate, with services wrapped around you, or into a dedicated stroke rehabilitation unit but close to home as possible for the individual's well psychological well-being and the family even mm. access as well so for various reasons we got halfway through a, a process of change um, and then things things uh, more kind of consultation was needed and then covid hits which everything everything sort of stopped mid-track really so in last year we started again looking at this this process largely driven, I have to say, by a, a bit of a crisis in, in one of the hospitals with stroke consultants. And we have been working up in the just in the background, but we knew we need to engage the potential solution for um, option four, which has been identified as the preferred solution by the clinicians and following the options appraisal. So we're just looking at the potential of that, but we, we won't be taking that any farther forward until we've done full engagement re-looked again at everything, made sure we're going in the right direction. And once again, look to the regional and national clinical leads just to make sure we're in the right, uh, right, uh, right direction. I just like to explain that a little bit more on this next slide so you understand for individual patients. So for Herefordshire and Paris patients, where Herefordshire County Hospital is the nearest imaging centre, that's where you get your scan basically, because it's there's, a, there's a, a period of time you need to get to a hospital to get a scan to know if it is a stroke or not. So if you've got a suspected stroke, the ambulance or ambulance is nine times out of 10 called, you would go to your nearest hospital still in any in these models, any of these models, to have the, um, the scan, basically. You'd have your scan at your nearest hospital. If it's clinically indicated that you need thrombolysis, which is getting rid of a clot that's caused a stroke, you would have that in that local hospital. So for individuals, if I sadly had a stroke now, I would go down the road to Hereford um, County Hospital, I would have a scan, and if I, if I needed the thrombolysis, I would get it there. If it was confirmed as a stroke, um, uh, you'd have, you'd have that, that treatment. If, it's, if, it was a, if you require a thrombectomy, which is a very highly specialised, you would be transferred to um, Birmingham hospitals, and that happens now. Very small numbers, but that happens now. You continue to do that. If you've had that treatment, you've had the, stro the stroke at Y Valley, though, you would be transferred in this model, option four, to Worcester Acute Hospital for the hyperacute stroke episode and the acute the, the, the inpatient hospital episode, where we want to develop the workforce to be 24-7 to, to, to give you the best chance to um, recover from in, that, in that acute phase. And then you'd be coming back to, if you're in Herefordshire or Powys, coming back to your local area for your, for your rehabilitation, as I said. And Worcestershire, the same, exactly the same process you can see there. That would happen in Worcestershire as well. Now, this is a, this is a, a potential at the moment. We're not saying this is, you know, this is signed off, agreed or anything. There's a, lo a long way to go on this. But what we want to do is engage with the public and and all the stakeholders look at this again look at all the evidence again but we're a part of a process ultimately where we'd have to go through whatever we design following the engagement 
we have to go through a clinical senate regional process with the experts clinically who would say yay or nay basically this is this is safe clinical practice or, or not there's other things to consider there's workforce planned there's trying to get more workforce anyway which is challenging um, different roles we might want to consider to support us there's obviously the financial framework around this as well um, that has to be considered so a lot of work to do but this is the stage we're at where we want to engage with as many people groups as possible to have people have their say and to influence have we forgotten anything have we what have we not considered I, I just I remember the last the last uh, um, attempt at this and there was a big concern from one of the public groups about families from this, and I'm not great at geography, so from the south of Herefordshire, getting to um, Worcester Acute in that first 72 hours to see their loved ones, and how could we support the people who haven't got transport or are frail and elderly, how could we support that? And, you know, that was a, a big thing that came through for most groups last time. We want to get that same views again, we want to get the same views of the public and groups and uh, the groups again. So that's where we are at the moment. Lots of lots of thinking still. In, in, we're still in that sort of thinking phase. There is a at the moment a preferred option. It could alter slightly from the feedback we're getting, but you know we want to get people's views. I mean, Kerry will talk about the engagement more if you've got more questions than that. But happy to take any questions on what we've said so far. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, I think. I'd like to hear, if I may, um, from, from Girish, uh, who I think is on the call, from, from a point of view of kind of uh, clinical stroke specialist point of view, whether this uh, proposed change is for the benefit of the, uh, the patient. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely it does. Uh... Considering the infrastructure that we have, the workforce that we have, it's uh, it's impossible uh, to even in the near future to envisage such a plan where we'll have enough specialists working at two sides. Uh, across the length and breadth of the country, we've had uh, numerous models looked at, and the one which has come up quite robust has been the the hub and spoke model where you will have uh, patients uh, across the region coming in to the hub for an hyperacute stroke care. And once they're finished and they are once they're medically stable, they get back to the satellite hospitals for ongoing rehab if needed. And I think this is the best way to move forward. Um, in terms of um, patient care itself, uh, obviously, which is the center of uh, the discussion, anybody within the Hereford area or far uh, southwest to say so, which is the farthest. Um, the first thing they need to do, should they have a stroke is obviously try and get an urgent CT scan done. And if that is what we need, Hereford would obviously uh, be the first choice to get in there, get the scan done, which would then be liaised uh, with us or with the tertiary center, should there be a need for thrombectomy. And following that uh, initial uh, treatment at Hereford, they could obviously then be moved straight to Worcester for further ongoing care. At this point in time, as I said, uh, we really do not have much other options uh, in terms of uh, establishing a hassle on both sides uh, for, for, uh, for various reasons we just explained. I mean, nationally, we are really struggling to recruit stroke specialists to hospitals and this is not something uh, acute it's been going on for a number of years at the moment and uh, given the circumstances we are in um, I think uh, probably this is the best model. Thank you very much it's very helpful. Councillor Summers. Thank you Chair. Um, the only question well, the only thing I not mentioned is ambulance um, from the from the home to the hospital uh -huh. and that's that's one of the I guess the toughest places to be if you're having a stroke because you need to be taken care of right away. So, uh, and with the ambulance service having so many problems, is are there issues there, and can they be overcome? I know it's difficult to overcome that because you can't get people to work. But anyway, it's just a concern because that's where it starts, and if we don't get it there, we're in trouble. Thanks. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll come in, but Anita might want to come in as well. So, yeah, I mean. Yeah, a stroke, a suspected stroke, is, is classed as what we call category one. Um, so there is a pre-alert, or there will be a pre-alert into the hospitals. The hospital knows we've got somebody coming in with a, a suspected stroke. 
and they bite and you know rightly or I think it's rightly a bypass patients that aren't as as, um, as as severe so getting them to the hospital getting them into the scan is that you know we call it the golden hour that we need them in there within the hour to have that done I mean that you know our, our paramedic workforce is probably one of the strongest areas of workforce in the NHS at the moment um, but you know they've got to have dedicated pathways to get those patients in quickly handed over into into that scan the hospitals and this is a, you know another thing the hospitals have got to have the dedicated slots in the scanning department so the patients aren't waiting to get into the scanner that's that's that that's another thing that we're considering in all this work because that is the crucial that is the crucial um, part of it in a proposed model where we're moving patients between Herefordshire and, and indeed Paris into Hereford and Worcester we we would work with the ambulance service if that's the preferred model going forward that's the agreed model on how we how we support the movement of those patients around um, um, you know, to make sure they get as quickly as possible to you know, a hazard that we would we could if we had one hazard in the in the ICS how they would get there quickly that will be part of the development after this but I'm I'm personally less concerned about the ambulance bit of it it's the the rest it's the workforce for the rest of it I'd be more concerned about. Well, thank you, Mary. But well, I, well, I understand that in the questionnaire out to the public, I think they might be concerned. Yeah, no, totally. So agree. I think that should be referenced in there yeah. somewhere. No. If you wouldn't mind. Good point. Thank you. I don't find that much. You mind just. I mean, Councillor Summers is, is quite right in terms of speed of response, but it's just the sheer capacity. Are you confident that the ambulance service has the capacity for all these extra journeys? Because we're now adding the extra journey to get somebody from Hereford to Worcester, ultimately then another journey to get them back from Her from Worcester to Hereford, and, and certainly the public perception of ambulance services is that there isn't this spare capacity to be moving people around, uh, let alone the, the the critical first journey. Yeah, I mean, what we would, if this was agreed, what we would do, we would commission more capacity to do this. We wouldn't expect them to do it in their current capacity. They they do much better than most areas, I say, in recruiting workforce and training their workforce. That that they are one of the stronger areas. I mean, we're talking three patients a day across across our whole ICS. So the likelihood, if it's going to be one extra movement a day, that would probably be it. It's not. It is not massive numbers at all. Um, you know, I mean, I know the, the Welsh Ambulance Service were concerned about this, but we'd expect the Welsh Ambulance Service to go to White Valley Trust, as we said, in that initial uh, scan, etc. They would then go back to Wales. They wouldn't be expecting them to take the patient to, to Worcester if that was the, if that was the model. We, would have, we will set up a dedicated transport, as we do for other things. John might want to go. We do it for cardiac now, but we're talking probably probably about one, one, one to two a day maximum patient transfers between the two. Councillor Chairman. Yeah, can, can I just come back on the, uh, the figure three? But where, where's, how's that derived in the sense that I'm presuming that is that historic? And because of COVID and COVID has an effect on strokes, has that been factored into this in the sense that it increases the number and the likelihood, particularly in the more severe COVID, admittedly? I just wondered where that figure had come from. Anita, do you want to come in on that one? I mean, I'll happily, but do you want to come in? Uh, yes, yeah, so we have to undertaken some public health modelling on this in terms of looking at previous incidents of strokes um, and then obviously then forecasting that forward to 2035. So we're looking at it in terms of future proofing it, not only looking at it over the next couple of years. Um, I think the other thing that is kind of quite notable really is the number of stroke mimics that come through as well. So patients that are suspected strokes who actually go into their imaging centre and some of those, about 50% of them, will actually turn out not to be a stroke and therefore will not continue on the stroke pathway. It will only be those patients who are a confirmed stroke who have then subsequently had treatment and then need to go on to hyperacute care. So it is, it is kind of based on evidence in terms of incidence of numbers historically, which obviously we did see a drop, particularly in Hereford during the period of COVID, but actually we are seeing that go back up and then we'll be using that as a, as a forecasting tool and we have done up to 2035. Thank you, so they are pre-COVID figures, but COVID will have made an effect, but the effect will not be sufficient to uh, make that figure markedly different as you're just suggesting. 
I mean, it was, it was interesting. We saw an increase in Worcestershire, not a massive increase in strokes over COVID, but not in Herefordshire, which is interesting. Um, but it has started to even out again now, back to what it was before. Our biggest concern is the changing age demography. Okay, so that's, 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 uh, that's why we're plotting forwards, because it's the age profile you know, that, that of the next 15, 20 years that is, is quite concerning. I think we need to be very clear here that you're talking about improving but actually what you're talking about is how can we make a service work? It's not really the service we would all want to see. It's actually what we can possibly do. And I think uh, the, uh, the other speaker a moment ago rather made that point. We can't recruit, we can't get the right number of people. So actually what we're saying is this is not what we wish to have. And I don't think it's really an improvement. It's what we can actually cope with. Well, maybe we'll be very careful. We don't put spin on this. This is a this is a patch on a on a, a system that is struggling, and it would be something which we all want to see markedly improved to get to a standard which we would like to see. Yes, definitely. And I, I'm sort of concerned that the first 24, 48 hours is being used when it's usually the first four and a half hours that are the marker hours to get stuff done. So I, I do find myself saying, hang on, 48 hours. 24, 48, by then you've got significant ischemic damage. You would expect, therefore, what you're then talking about is long term. Yeah. If you actually want to get something done, you mentioned it, the golden hour, yeah. you need to get in treatment in, in, in very early. And how we can get that done in our remote populations seems to be vital. Yeah. And the key to that is do we and how can we get enough scanning? Uh, possibility by our time in order to make sure that our diagnosis is right as to whether we've got a clot or a bleed, you know, where, where, what's going on. So I just want to be a little cautious with the language in this. This, this is fair to say, this is a patch on the system. It's not actually the system we want to be at, where we want to be. I mean, the reason for us being here today is we want to, we, we know we need to improve this. We need to future-proof it as well. But I just want to be, it's probably clear, when, Patients will still get access to their local, the closest hospital for their scan and that thrombolysis treatment if they need it. And that, that first hour is really important. The next period of acute, the hyperacute stroke unit, that's where we, have, we are. Because we, we do need to be that, that needs to be 24 7 to manage that patient in that first, you know, 24 70, up to 72 hours. That's where we want to improve. Our, our care um but yeah we, we, we've had we've had some you know very close incidents of not being able to have a service as i've said so we want to few, make it more resilient and find ways to do that there's multiple ways of doing it but what we want to do is engage with everyone to, to improve it but we know we've got to get on and, and deliver something thank you uh, john barnes yeah <clears throat> thank you just wanted to say and i agree that the, there is a level of pragmatism involved in this this work in terms of <clears throat> trying to address the problem with the national shortage of stroke <laughs> clinicians. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's able to get a frog in the throat, which soon you can speak. Um, but this model is about trying to make sure that we get as much consultant coverage and, cl and clinical decision-making support into the system. So should we adopt option four, for instance, there would be 24-7 access to a consultant who knows the system and knows the nurses and knows the doctors involved in that care. Now, that, that, for Hereford, that may well be remote, but that would improve our decision making around thrombolysis. And that, so that initial response that, 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 that colleagues have, have pointed out is so very important would be enhanced in this model. It clearly, in a different world, you might be looking at putting in a, a 24 7 solution in Hereford and a 24 7 solution in Worcester for the whole stroke pathway, but that's so unrealistic. That, that I think that's probably not something that we we could we could imagine we'd be able to deliver. So I think there are some some clinical benefits that might come along with this model, but we do need to go through that work. But that additional consultant decision making would help the pathway. Thank you. Yes, I, mean, I think that's a very good description. Um, so I was going to just kind of mention because we've talked about uh, patients from South Carolina. There are a group of patients in the South of Paris who do not access their healthcare through the English NHS but through the yeah. Welsh uh, primary care network. Uh, and so, how would it work for them? I mean, as 
the patient will initially go to the closest hospital. The ambulance service always do that anyway. So if it's a query stroke, if they're going to a, a hospital in Wales, I'm not an expert on this, John might know more than me, now they will carry on going to that hospital in Wales for their initial treatment as they are now. This is more that this is more for our the, the Paris patients that come to come to Y Valley um, and for the Herefordshire patients that you know that their closest acute hospital post going to their ED in, in Y Valley is Worcester Acute. So I'm actually kind of quite interested in what the various times are for, for this. Because you know, especially on Saturday home, there's glorious Welsh Newton and they have a stroke. Um what is the time for me to get to Hereford versus my time to get to potentially Neville Hall, potentially uh, Cumbran? Um, and, and whether that prejudices my health outcomes? I'm not alone, but there's quite a few patients down there. <laughs> we have one a few years but ago. Very often it's just not in the thinking or the modeling. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just I'm just, just raising that. So could, yeah. could, we, could we consider? Yeah, uh, English patients on the world for the use of Welsh. We'll definitely include that. We did a few years ago do a, a time study on this, but it does need to be refreshed. But we will include that definitely in that in there uh, in that thinking. Yeah, there probably are a few. Uh, also, you would go to Shropshire on the you know frankly we leak in in all directions. Yeah, so, yeah, that's quite a large border. Um, by um, take to come up with the discussion on obesity, which affects a much larger number of people for many more years. So at a practical level, could you explain the money you're bidding for? Who are you bidding against? I mean, would that then, you know, is that money that could in theory be spent on obesity or is it could you just tell us a little bit about the big process? Oh, but if we agreed this and we were going to spend money on it, okay. And indeed, yeah. how much you currently spend? Or, or on stroke you... altogether? Yes. Yeah, okay. I can't give you the exact e amount of money, no. but I, e I know Anita might be able to answer that because we did do a piece of work on this a while ago. I, I deal with too many numbers, I can't remember them all. Um, I mean, this is this goes to the heart of the NHS at the moment and the prioritisation that we, the, the frameworks that we're going to, we have to put in place. And it much depends on the financial frameworks coming down from the government. We, you know, if we agree option four, there may be capital requirements that we need, so we might have to spend money on capital, um, but there will be a lot of revenue. There'll be a lot of extra costs for revenue, workforce, et cetera, that we'd have to do. Stroke is one of our top four priorities in the ICS at the moment, but there are a lot of competing priorities. You know, it's that balance between the prevention agenda which you know helps all of this but maintaining services and re keeping the resilient and having to spend resource on that and that's a, a you know an age-old problem it has probably got more challenging in recent years i'd suggest um but you know we with the ice the integrated care board will ultimately make the decision on which of the priorities uh, that we uh, that we we spend our I spend our money on? It's usually, in fairness, a balance of all. So once we decide on what's the best clinical model, what's the best pathway that we will have for our integrated care services, we will then look at the the cost and the cost benefit analysis of that. Um, my concern is the growing elderly population. I think I've said it three times now. The growing elderly population and being able to manage that because um, you know we have. Uh, we daily, not in Hereford, during Worcestershire, I daily go through the patients waiting to come out of the hospital uh, following a stroke, and the age is usually between 90 and 100 now. So, you know, so uh, the aging population is definitely starting to impact, um, and we want to give them as the best chance as anybody else, really. So it is, it is a tough, a tough balance that we have to seek. But we need to understand what this would cost in reality, and then the integrated care board will make the decision about about you know is is this the best way to deliver this and it, it what's the cost benefit analysis on it yeah. so is for interest obesity one of your top four priorities or not prevention overall prevention is prevention. one of our top four priorities yeah which obesity will be a, a stream yeah. of that and then um, it would be lovely to hear because if someone else had got them but the other things i'm thinking is that i'm glad to see the community hospital club because they have often felt quite vulnerable and threatened, certainly the minor injuries, which I know is something yeah, quite different. Yeah. But if, if this model would give it an additional certainty to the community hospitals, that would certainly be welcomed. Mm. And then the final thing was that 
from a practical point of view, unless you have a 24 hour scan that, yes, obviously, if you turn up Herefordshire, they go, mate, we'll be back on at nine o'clock tomorrow, then it does seem to me that your plan should include a 24 hour scan. Yeah, definitely. But could you could you tell us about that? Yes. So if if we go with a model of where, where we want the HAZU or before people get to HAZU to have that ability to have a 24 hour scan and the HAZU needs it as well, but they need ability. For, but you've got to, what we need is to do is ring fence, fence some slots to have the capacity to ring fence slots for those three patients a day. So nobody is waiting. Um, to have a scan that gives them that diagnosis or if any sometimes on the first scan and Girish is a better expert than me it's not always apparent you need another scan in a few hours and you know we need to make sure those patients have real access to the scan so the capital I talked about would be for building space but for technology and equipment as well which and includes scan. Yes, yeah because yeah. that does seem from a heritage point of view a, a crucial aspect of yeah. the plan Just quickly now, just to pick up a point, because twice now you've said the three a day, but surely with this growing concern of our older population, and this also goes back to, oh, it's only probably one extra ambulance trip, trip a day, the, 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 the incident is going to get higher. So in fact, actually, it will be more than one ambulance trip a day. It will be more than one or two extra scans a day required. So... Um, you know, are you confident about the capacity in, in, in part of this future proofing? As I think, as Anita said, she's we're modeling this to 2035. So mm -hmm. once we've completed that modeling, which we know it's going to grow, there's no doubt about that, we would then commission alongside that the growth and the expansion that we need. I mean, we do need we, it would be helpful if national workforce planning caught up with everybody. I think at the moment we we need more doctors, nurses, paramedics trained to help us mm -hmm. in the next five to ten years. Um, but, you know, we are looking at ways, we're looking at our workforce as well and the tasks they do and could they be done in a different way? Could they be done by more nurse specialists, you know, more, more therapists? But we still need more of those as well. So the modelling will show us what we need and then we'll commission alongside that. But it'll be a graduated, it won't be straight away, it'll be a graduated increase. Can I just merely come back on Kevin's point? I, that's a mean of giving us three, not a model. I'll yeah. tell you what, what the actual span of that is going to be. It might be because usually more strokes in winter than summer. Therefore, we're going to have a difference in time of travel, difference in winter than summer. I hope your modeling is going to give us the uh, confidence limits around this because I would be very concerned that three a day sounds very nice, but it could be that it's six on Sunday and, and nothing on Monday. And, and we need to therefore to the resilience of this I'm questioning and would want to see in any model. Yeah, okay, that's helpful. We'll bring that into it. Thank you. So, again, it's just uh, start winding this discussion up. Uh, Councillor Summers, the last thing. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just um, prevention and aftercare, I guess they come quite close together because if you work with prevention and aftercare, still get prevention, I guess. That's true, yeah. Um, so how are we doing on communication? So for example, I'm, I have unstable angina and I know I did the trip to watch them back. I went to the doctors about a week later and they put everything on standby because I have an unstable angina. So there was a good communication thing in place. I think sometimes it's not so good as you know. So how are the communication between, if, if for, for, from stroke victims to their GP is, is, it, is it flagged that they, Oh yes, yes. I know I would appreciate it is, but is there a backup on it? I don't know, is there a checkup on it? Make sure, do they have to say they've received it? Because quite often there is a communication problem between the hospital and the GP on information. Okay. And okay. they don't, there's not always a good, it's just my concern, should the, the patient or are they told to contact their GP and make sure the GP is aware? Okay. Um, I mean, the experts are probably on the gallery on that because they work in it every day. But I, I worked in hospital for a long time. There is an electronic um, information that goes to the GPs to explain what's happened to the patient. Mm -hmm. There is follow-up from the hospital as well shortly afterwards. 
And a lot of these patients, unless they need no care at all, will have social, will have rehabilitation staff wrapped around them who often liaise with the GP on a day to day basis. Does it work every single time? Probably not. I'm, I'm sure there's instances where it doesn't work at all. But, you know, but part of, part of I mean, it's good feedback. I think part of it is making sure that we put as much robust processes in place to make sure primary care is, is aware. They should, they should within, I think it's 48 hours, know that the patients come home and they've got a, and, and they've had a stroke and what their treatment plan has been. John, Giresh, anything I've missed there? Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, we have a very robust system uh, uh, for patients who have been uh, discharged from hospital, uh, either back home or to the uh, community hospitals for uh, ongoing rehab. We do uh, do an electronic discharge letter with uh, all details of what's been going on in the hospital, the investigations they've had, the treatment they've received, and what would be the future plan. All of that will be communicated to um, uh, the community hospitals where they might be transferred to or to the GP. And also, more importantly, most of our stroke patients, um, when they do get discharged from hospital, as uh, uh, Mary was saying, will have support from the community stroke team. The community stroke team would either be um, seeing patients in their own residence um, in, in the situation where the patient's been discharged home uh, or uh, would be in touch with, uh, they would probably act as a liaison between the patient and their GP. So often uh, there is always a good communication between the stroke team at Worcester and the community uh, team, um, in, which would in, involve the physiotherapist, the occupation therapist, the speech and language therapist, um, and uh, everything would be pretty much discussed about the patient uh, in uh, either of the channels. So I don't think that's going to be an issue at all. Most of our patients uh, obviously will fall into the remits when it comes to um, being um, having effective communication with the stroke association. We always have a safety net from that point of view as well. So uh, I don't think that's going to be uh, a problem. Yes, uh, no system is 100% foolproof uh, to say so. We would have probably patients who are um, uh, in the remotest area and uh, you know we might struggle to get hold of them through various communication channels or means. Uh, that is something which obviously we need to work on. But by and large, uh, we would be quite uh, good in terms of communication with most of our patients. Thank you. Just one more question, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. And that is, um, once you've had a stroke, I guess you're always susceptible, like any other disease, for another one down the road. So is there anything like a bracelet? I know um, in some cases, in some dis problems, you, you wear a bracelet to show that you, you may have a, an issue with it. I'm not sure if there's anything like that in stroke. Uh, because if you if you have if you've had a stroke previously and you're you're collapsed in the street, for example, or another stroke, if you wear a bracelet or you have something on you that tells them that you've had a stroke and they can go to work right away. It's just a quick, I know it's a way down the road, but it's just a question. Thanks. That's a good question. I don't know the answer. I don't know if Goresh or uh, no, um that's that's quite interesting. Um it's definitely worth looking at that um, from, from a public point of view. Uh, we do not have any such thing either locally or nationally, uh, but uh, something to be considered, I would say. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's really good suggestion. Thank you, Councillor. So the other thing that I just wanted to ask about CREA um, follow-up, uh, it's my understanding that it's a telephone uh, consultation, is that correct, or is it in face-to-face? -face? Um, I'll look to Giresh and John. I, I believe the first one's face-to-face. -face. I know in COVID we have to make changes to that, but um, Giresh, TIA now, what are we doing? At the moment, uh, we, have, we are having seven slots per day. So uh, we tend to see uh, most of our patients face to face, uh, definitely patients who've been referred through the primary care as against a patient uh, who's already visited 
our emergency department the previous night where they've had some kind of initial workup done and seen by a doctor. So those group of patients, we sometimes uh, do a telephone and of course uh, get them back straight for investigation should they need one. But most of the patients who's uh, been referred to us from the primary care setup do get a face-to-face and it's a one-stop clinic where uh, we do both neuro uh, imaging as well as the vascular imaging, including blood tests. We try and uh, uh, f- close the loop on the same day, uh, but there will be situations where we might have to follow them up uh, with regards to the investigations, such as you know a cardiac monitor and things like that. But on most occasions, we tend to close the loop uh, on that first visit itself. Thank you very much, and thank you to uh, all of our uh, guest panelists today for their, their inputs. Much appreciated by the committee. Thank you very much. Um, so, do we have any uh, comments from the David Hitchner, Councillor Hitchner? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, Mary, first of all, thank you very much for coming personally. We've had a lot on Zoom calls. Um, and to, and, and, yeah, uh, nice to see you face to face. Yeah, yeah. Um, not, not about having a go at all those who are on the screen because I'm sure <laughs> they've got lots of. <laughs> um, I, I, um, I, I read through uh, the, re- the report, uh, and, and like my colleagues, I was looking for the reference to the four hour golden period. Part of the reason, and this is again personal experience, my son's a paramedic, and he said to me, Dad, if you ever have a stroke, you get to hospital within four hours. That is the golden time. So that's, that is, that's why I think, it, and it's been raised by a number of people here. And when I read the paper, the only place I saw the four hours mentioned is in the definition section, which I thought, hmm, it's hit, kind of hidden away. And I think we need to be very, I, I think the more we communicate to the community yep. that they need to get to a hospital within four hours, the better the prospect. And going on the, the website yep. for um, Stroke Association, they say 10% more patients survive and live independently 10% more as a result of getting to the hospital yeah. in that period. So if I could ask yeah, no, the, 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 that to yeah. emphasize in the paper, yeah. it, 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 I think in the paper it, it says something about um, how we raised all the issues yeah. correctly. You have done today, but they're not in the paper. Okay. And I, I'd like that to be really yeah, that's right. so that's one thing. And the other thing I think as Peter Jim was saying, uh, this is the best we can do with the resources we've got. Now we have that issue continually in the local authority, and, and we and we don't ball from it. We don't pretend that. It, and, and I just feel it, it needs. I read it and I thought this sound. This is the best service we can have. Well, and it's uh, the best given the resources. But I don't think that's a problem. I, I don't think that's a problem to say that. Yeah. So so if I could just reinforce what Councillor Jenman was okay. saying there. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, it's really helpful. Thank, Thank you, you. Just, uh, Yes, and I think uh, as Chris we're probably in agreement with that, we'll be happy to see that as a uh, under our, our helpful suggestions, recommendations. Um, so the covering report has a recommendation the committee is assured that the wider public engagement undertaken on improving stroke services across Hampshire and Worcestershire will be focused on delivering the required improvements to uh, further inform possible solutions. And I'm just going to turn to Mr. Carl to see if we've picked up any additional uh, recommendations or comments. Chair, I may suggest it may be that you have some observations and suggestions in this case. Um, I've noted a few points uh, that the committee have raised. Um, Firstly, the, the model or the consultation of the model should consider uh, how how services can get early diagnosis and treatment to people in remote populations, specifically patients to be able to get seen, get treatment within the four hour period. Also, there's a need to understand the budget implications and how the proposals would uh, affect costs uh, in reality uh, and how the ICE the integrated care board would make decisions with consideration of the cost benefit analysis. Also that there's a need to be confident that capacity of ambulance services of the capacity of ambulance services and other local services to support this model as part of future proof 
including proper proposals. And there was a suggestion that people who have suffered a stroke be offered identity bracelets to identify them as um, more at risk for stroke. And they can, can we just add in um, something around awareness of uh, those patients on the monitoring order? Um, what, whether this patient is self out of them travel time? I suspect it would be to Gloucester. Yeah, but I don't know. I'm not 100% sure. I mean, John may know, but I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, just, just to have an awareness of something. Can I just add a quick comment? We, yeah. we did some early engagement several years ago and we went down to the South Wake County and spoke with quite a few uh, patient groups um, that had experience with stroke services and almost all of them had had their initial treatment in Cheltenham. You know, most of them have gone to oh, yeah. for, their, yeah. for their acute treatment at that time. So we did talk to a lot of them. That, that yeah. it's, it's geographically really tricky because mm -hmm. it's on the border. Yeah. Of everything, yeah. Well, they, they tended to go there for their acute phase and then they were back in yeah. some caricature for their rehab, etc. community hospital. Right. I, th I think the other thing there would be to have an engagement with the you know, case of referrals coming from GP referral, and the GPs are aware that they could refer to Cheltenham and they don't automatically refer to where the nearest Welsh hospital would be that has stroke sensors. Would we be able to have? One about clarifying that you were proposing a 24 hour scan yes. option in yeah. because I don't think that it's explicitly stated at Heritage. Thank you. Can we have the resilience for the time? It's a mean of three. What does mm. that mean in terms of the six on Sunday? Um, it could. Um, they could confident then that the the, 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 the model can accommodate the extremes either in the mean which that's a mean three that can accommodate six um, a month. So two fluctuations for yeah. a month. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. it because it, it will if you're saying the existing is three, yeah. that doesn't mean that per day that's it three. Yeah. Six. It could be six, it could be ten. Yeah. I don't know what the model, what the actual yeah. figures show. Right. And if it's more in winter than summer, it might actually be the bias in winter is higher. So, you know, the model needs um, a bit of refining in terms of the data needs to uh, looking at to see. It's just the problem, resilience, isn't it? So we know the resilience. Is that, yeah. And uh, I'm not sure, <clears throat> two quick points, and I'm not sure that one of them is very, you know, the, the points have been made about the speed of response and, and treatment. Um, but I can already hear people saying, well, you're telling us we have to be seen more quickly, but you actually want to go, us to go to Worcester. So somehow it needs to it needs to somehow be reflected in the sense of, I know we're expecting you to go further, but actually you won't go further in this. You see, do you see what I mean? That it it's almost seems counterintuitive that everything we have been drummed into us about stroke is early treatment and people are going to go, but we are sending us to Worcester, so somehow that needs to be seen. And the second, uh, the second point is, uh, and this is very immediate because I had somebody in tears when I told them what I was going to discuss this afternoon, who has a mother being treated in Hereford at the moment, and she said, but we can barely get to Hereford to see her at the moment. So you did mention it very early on, Mary, uh, we need something to reflect or to recognise the challenges that will be involved for travel, in terms of travel yeah. for relatives, you know, particularly uh, you know, the woman I was talking to was, was the daughter, but an awful lot of, of relatives of stroke victims are elderly exactly. spouses, um, often without transport, um, and there are big implications of, of, of them getting to Worcester. <laughs> It may only be, but it's a very critical seventy two hours for the for the relatives. Yeah. Speaking of somebody who couldn't visit my other half, it's a little bit interesting to know. Yeah. Uh, just a quick scan of above men, but it's more um, uh, more more strokes in men in March to May 
and in, in women from December to February. There's actually sex difference in it. Yeah. So I think it's quite... I mean, we have noticed over the last the summer, we seem to see, uh, whether that was COVID or not, it was it was very hard to see, but we did see a summer spike. Definitely it was... You know what? We've we seen everything on a couple of months. 64% of the yeah. experience. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to go back to Mr. Parler for those other uh, tweets. And then we'll wrap up. So, half the chair. Um, also observed that uh, and suggested that the 24 hour scan in Hereford here be retained in the model. Also, that the model should show confidence that uh, it can accommodate fluctuation in demand over the average. Also, that it clarified um, the tension between, or the perceived tension between being patients being seen at Worcester and also the need for, for the, mm. the public health uh, need to be seen quickly. Is that clear? Yeah. And that the committee recognises that increased travel times for relatives may arise, and where practical provision be made. To the and we all have to do that. Uh -huh. Show hands. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, all our. Participants in the nice virtual and in person. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we're just going to wrap up now with the agenda item nine progress reports. Right, we can't introduce that. Excuse me, officer. To introduce the title. Thank you, Chair. This is just a brief item. Um, this is a standing item on street security as a progress report, and the purpose of it is, is to report back to the committee on issues arisen from the previous meeting, information requested at the previous meeting, and any recommendations made to the cabinet and the executive response and to external decision makers. Uh, and the, the function of that is, is to be sure that we are able to track information requested and issues raised and the recommendations to the executive and the response coming back so that they can see that and a recommendation will be appended to the progress report future recommendations made so that you can track those and ask questions about the implementation oh, chair i should just mention uh, one thing is to say that at the last meeting as is recorded in the minutes um, there, there was uh, a decision to prepare the draft report of the intensive poultry industry on human health and well-being for further consideration. And a meeting has been held with Councillor Jinman on behalf of the committee to review the report with uh, Councillor Norman and Councillor Marsh. And that will be referred to a future meeting. Thank you much, Charles. I was wondering if I was expecting that on this agenda, so I that's but it's progressing, so that's great. And we'll see that hopefully at the next meeting. Um, also have a note here um, that there was a suggestion for dementia provision in Herefordshire to uh, form part of the item on domiciliary and residential care, uh, which is scheduled for March. Uh, or for an update to be requested in the form of a briefing note initially. I would like a briefing note initially. And we uh, um, reserve the right to bring it forward for the March meeting as well. I think an initial briefing um, note for the committee would be the right way to go, if that's okay. Um, do any, any other members of the committee got any comments? Uh, Councillor Sons? Yes, thanks, Chair. I'd like to have included in January's uh, meeting, if it's possible, in the access to council wellbeing services that we include employees of the council and make sure that they are taken care of and the information is is available or not so much available but is delivered to them anyway thank you 
Yeah, I, mean, I think it's just a general rule that uh, access to services. The first thing you need is the information that there's a service that you can access. And that sometimes that's not always not always as clear as it might be. I can't I mean, I'm not quite sure if we finished that bit yet, but it's the work plan usually a standing item because it's just the, uh, the last committee I went to the work plan was a standing item and in fact yeah. holding the work plan does I had to go to the scrutiny management to get the work plan and it's just I'm very aware that you know things happen and mm -hmm. that it needs a little bit of yeah, tidying yeah, yeah. I wonder if yeah, no, it's trying to be normal to have the way it's trying, I mean, it, it used to be. I mean, that was, but but you know, we're, we're trying something new and different, yeah, and, um, and it's evolving. Um, does the committee generally would they welcome the work plan being appended to, to, to the agenda, even just an appendix item and a brief, um, for, for, for any dynamic change that might occur? Because mm -hmm. actually, I agree with you, I think work plans should be very dynamic and should be responsive and dynamic and not yeah. set at the start of the year and never change. So, mm -hmm. and um, yes, yeah, so with the same count, how, how, how well. well uh, well, for example, I found this very useful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's great that the AB's new plan, as you said, so well followed the lines of inquiry wanted, and sometimes yeah. it, it's just handed the time before to have a quick look at yes. the next time and check we've got. I think, yeah, I think that's fine. I think all in all in agreement okay, with that's that. Good. Um, that's that's noted, yeah. and uh, yeah. obviously, if he wishes to review his work program, that could be included by the chair at the next meeting. I would just. Uh, and that the plans are simply that the plan, and they do not prevent members of the yeah. chair including items on a on an agenda if they're not on the plan. It is flexible to that degree. You don't need to yeah. agree in the plan first, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, if you'd yeah. like to review the plan. I think it's just helpful to see it. You can't be yeah, to read this to all kinds of helpful things. So Councillor Chen. I just wonder whether the progress report coming at the last item of the day, when we've gone through everything else, whether or not. In the future, it should actually occur right at the beginning and we able to question and look at what progress has been made before we get on to other subjects. It is a danger it gets passed over and rather quickly. Out there's, of the way. there's always a danger that the last one is going to be at the end. Yeah. We have already been there past the three hour uh, mark, haven't we? Yeah. So, yeah, I just want to know. So, no, 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 I completely agree. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. There's just one more point, which is I'm very aware that this year that the scrutiny management board is leading the scrutiny of the budget and our best understanding at the moment is that there will be a 6.3 million deficit in adult social care. Mm -hmm. and. I wonder how this committee can best feed in yourself to feed in, and also how we might be kept apprised of how the large department that we are, the, the scrutiny committee for, are proposing to, to approach this difficult task. So, would it be possible for you to just at least keep us up to date of at, at the next meeting? Because 6.3 is, is quite a large pressure, and that, you know, that may. Frankly, it got worse by the time we get to the actual budget. Indeed, yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. So that would be a sort of item. Well, as, yeah, or, as, or as far as I'm, as I'm able, able I'll yeah. do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, good. Thank you very much. So, uh, agenda item number 10. Today's the next meeting, Friday, 25th of November. That's 10 a.m. And so I'm now closing this meeting. Thank you very much. So please confirm the live feed has been stopped.